folks up there. Great. Um, so let, let's start by um, just introducing ourselves um, to see who's uh, who's with us today, um, and we'll we'll start in the room, and then we'll we'll join. We'd like everybody who's online to join us uh, next. Looks so like we've got about seven people so far, and three more texting me. They're joining soon. So um, I'll, I'll get us started and go right around. Uh, my name is Daza Greenwood. Uh, I'm a lecturer and scientist here at MIT Media Lab and a fellow at MIT Connection Science, uh, which is in the School of Engineering. Uh, and um, uh, this um, class, the IAP um, Computational Log Course, is now in its fifth um, season. And, uh, and it reflects research uh, that I've been doing here with Others uh, will be introducing themselves shortly, um, under mostly under Professor Sandy Pentland's um, lab, the Human Dynamics Lab, here in the Media Lab. And uh, the broad brush there, or the broad umbrella, we call computational social science, and um, and uh, that involves. What's, oh, look that! Oh, good. That was another fire alarm. Um, <laughs> Um, usually the fire alarm starts just when we're getting rolling, um, so I'm glad that wasn't it. Um, anyway, just to come right to it, uh, what the computational law is about uh, reimagining um, law as a, oh, is my mic on? Oops, sorry about that. Well, let me do a quick sound check here. Uh, for anybody online, um, can you hear my audio now? Um, anybody? If yes. someone could come off. Yep, all, all good does it. It's good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, those of you who responded. Um, re it's about reimagining law as uh, a system that is data driven, uh, that can be model based, and that can be um, explicitly engineered. So when you think of law, like rules, um, whether it's statutes or regulations in the public sector, or rules that are enforceable by um, private law, such as contracts, licenses, um, and other areas of law as well, common law, like even potentially torts, and um, common law of contracts, mm -hmm. um, among other things, administrative processes, legal processes, legal instruments. These all already are expressing themselves as data, uh, as software. Um, and practice, in a sense, has gotten out a little he ahead of the law. And so what we're looking at here is um, a, a conceptual framework, but also a very practical you know, engineering framework for, um, that is engineered uh, to, um, to, to uh, translate um, law tech and technology so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence just at the very highest level. We do that through prototypes. Uh, we do that through um, we do that through convening. We convene a lot with bar associations and with law schools and with law firms and with um, with vendors. Uh, we're joined uh, by one of our um, close collaborators in Thomson Reuters Labs today. So our the industry connections are really helpful to stay um, to make sure that we stay very very uh, focused on what's happening in the field um, and. Uh, and we do that through education. And so this IAP course is part of the educational um, prong of this uh, research initiative. And it's uh, the reason we're doing this through IAP partly is to share some of the best of what we've been up to, but also largely to open the um, front door and to hear from people that are interested uh, from the community to find out more about what you're up to and to uh, bounce ideas and get some idea flow going. So this is very much uh, designed to be uh, um, uh, discussion-oriented and open and collaborative session. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, pass it down the line to uh, the co-instructor, Brian Wilson. My name is Brian Wilson. I am the co-instructor for the IAP Computational Workshop course. In years past, I have also co-instructed, but before that, I was a teaching assistant for this course. Um, and I think one of the things that I really like about this course is it gives, it, it provides an opportunity to learn about things that haven't really yet happened. Um, and, and that's uh, kind of sparked a lot of interest for me in the space. Um, 
I work as the as a fellow in connection science with DAZA under Sandy Pentland, and also am serving as the editor in chief for the MIT Computational Law Report, where we're kind of taking the ethos from you know trying to figure out how we can reimagine, re-engineer the law, and uh, applying that to a publication so that people can you know almost reimagine a publication a little bit so that it's more interactive, more dynamic, more available to uh, adapt to the emergent changes in you know, technology and the things that are actually happening in the world. And so uh, I've had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I think that about does it from my side. And so I'll hand it down the line to Cool Brian. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> well, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Brian Ulysny. I run uh, Thomson Reuters Labs in the Americas. And um, should I just launch right into the what I'm going to talk about or no? Nope. Oh, all right. I run Thomson Reuters Labs Americas. We're a bunch of data scientists yep. and machine learning folks, uh, data visualization people and blockchain people, all working for Thomson Reuters, the giant information provider uh, so we provide information and data and research platforms to lawyers and tax professionals and uh, global trade professionals and we also have the uh, fabulous reuters news agency one of the most agencies in the world we have reporters in over 100 countries for over 100 years um, so here's something funny. Um, qu question for, for folks online. Are you now seeing Brian Ulysses' screen or are you now seeing a screen with like talking heads? Um, we see, I see both at least. Like I see the slides and then we also see in the corner um, whoever's actually put their webcam up. Interesting, okay. See if you can click on the right side. So with that to it, like how do you? Oh, uh, seems like that upper right thing. There's, there's a thing the... on the left that says switch to sharing content. So now it's just all the screen, right? Sorry, we we're we're used to using Google Hangout, and they recently discontinued their broadcast product. So we're now switching to a new <clears throat> to Zoom, and having a little bit of a time. There we go. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, maybe, maybe it's because, well, we'll just go with it. Um, so let, let's um, move around the room um, and then I'm gonna ask people online if they'd like to introduce yourself, if you'd like to introduce yourself. If you don't wanna introduce yourself, just say pass and that's okay, but it would be useful to, to know people, and actually, I have a ringer here, so I want to get started with an MIT Media Lab alum, uh, a guy who I went to college with, and the guy who introduced me to the Media Lab 20 years ago, uh, and a good friend and collaborator in the computational law space, Brendan Marr. Who are you, beyond what I just said? I'm, I'm, I'm Brendan Marr, but you know, first, Daza and, and Ryan, I have to say, you guys are being way too modest, right? You know, you should mention, of course, that the uh, MIT Computational Law Report had part of its, uh, you know, driving inception yeah. from this course last year. That's true. That's true. Sure. But uh, yes. Uh, so my name is Brendan Marr. I'm a Media Lab alum from '95 to '98, and uh, back then I was doing a, actually 3D audio and virtual reality. I was with the original virtual reality group, one of the first 150 people in the world doing that. But uh, today, I'm really excited to be here again because you know this this is where all action is happening. You know, in, in every aspect of of everything going forward, there's going to be some facet of legal contracts and the way we communicate and express ourselves at every level. And it is just phenomenal the things that I'm seeing. And I'm really glad to be here, and I hope that we're going to explore uh, a lot more of that. And this is my uh, fourth year in this class, a four out of five. Four out of five. Yeah. yeah. We've only had four classes calling it the computational law course, 
So let's just say that you've been to every one. Right. Okay. And thanks again for introducing me to the media lab. I don't know how to do this. Can I tell you to come to me a little bit? I'm sorry. We, uh, this is not the like home audio and video. We're so great at it, of course. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Linda Sutliff, and I teach here uh, as a lecturer in writing rhetoric and professional communications. So that means that I teach students how to write in their major field. So a lot of it is scientific communications, but I also teach over at Sloan. And at Sloan, I teach where in a field where I was a practitioner for many years, so I teach in finance. And the research that I've been doing on my own is really looking at financial disclosures and particularly the communication patterns that you can see in footnotes. Mm. Very interesting. It, have you looked at um, uh, the SEC's um, XBRL? Yes. So, yeah. Oh, we should definitely follow up and trade yeah. like little, you know, spelunking sessions down into those footnotes. Um, thank you so much. I'm so glad to see you this year. Um, would you like to? Great. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Hey, everyone. My name is Mergen, Mergen Natchen. Uh, I am a master's student at the Signal Kinetics Lab at the Media Lab. Uh, I was actually class of 2010. Um, I finished like nine years ago, or probably 10 years ago now. Um, I was an e, uh, CS major. I was working afterwards for about at Facebook for about nine years and then came back to school. So happy to be here. Okay. Welcome Thanks. back. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, again, actually, can I double check? And what, what interest do you have in computational law? What brings you to this IAP session? Um, I'll just hold it. Um, I don't have much background in it, but I want to learn uh, what I heard about it. Um, I was I followed the Stanford uh, Law um, Codex. Yeah, Codex. yeah, we love them. Yeah, so it seems like a com something similar. Oh, so did you hear about this through the Codex group? Uh, not really, but okay. uh, I was interested in the Codex. But I was like, hey, MIT also has something similar. So perfect. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you, um, Todd. Todd. Actually, can I hold it for you? Because oh, sure. people keep going like that. Oh, sorry about That's that. That's all right. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm Todd Wallach. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm currently spending this academic year as a as a fellow, a Neiman Berkman fellow at Harvard. Oh, you're that guy. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And I'm uh, emailing with you. And I'm on leave from the Boston Globe, where I'm an investigative and data journalist on the Boston Globe Spotlight team. Oh. Uh, Last year, I worked on a project with the Spotlight team looking at secret criminal court hearings in Massachusetts. And as part of that, analyzed uh, court data on thousands of hearings. And we unsuccessfully sued the state court system, trying to get access to uh, more information about those secret criminal court hearings. And I've been involved in a number of uh, suit seeking access to government data, which has long been a challenge. And it's particularly a challenge with the courts, which in Massachusetts and many other states are explicitly exempt from the public records law and selective in what information they disclose. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So, wow. Suing the courts, like trying to sting a bee, I would think. <laughs> yes. Um, brave soul. Uh, we should talk. Uh, so, one footnote here, I guess, myself. Yeah. We should bring in the um, e discovery and relativity adjacent use case for FOIA yeah. and some of the other um, analytics on FOIA stuff. Hi, come on up. Uh, MIT alum. MIT alum. In the house. Richard Amster. Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually uh, an independent uh, solo practitioner, patent attorney. Uh, my degree from MIT is in chemistry. I have a computer science degree. I worked for a couple of decades uh, hacking different kinds of things, including uh, generative document based mm -hmm. systems. So, and I worked in CAD CAM systems with knowledge based engineering. So, I'm quite interested in the process of using rule-based technology to um, create documents and systems, which is not exactly computational contracts, mm -hmm. but you could see the connection. Also, I'm quite interested in how uh, current trends in AI, which are non-representational uh, machine learning, um, just not gonna work in law. So I'm interested in understanding how uh, representational rule-based AI and procedural um, contracts and 
uh, adjudication processes could work. Okay, and by, um, so are, um, just to double check, I'm tuning in right. So like, with declarative languages like prologue or well, kind of document assembly kind of systems that are based on explicit business rules be well, along prologue, the lines? Well, prologue is obscure and nobody understands it. And, but I do think there is a way for explicit representation. Uh, um, I'm a little bit of a, an old timer. My uncle Marvin helped found the oh, media lab. Okay. So uh, the not, you know, frame-based representations and all the other kinds of things that we thought about uh, possibly happening in the old style AI, I think they're gonna end up having to come back in order for us to make progress in these fields. And um, doing the conventional law work that I do, which involves technology startups and patents and some litigation, um, bored to death. Mm. And I would like to see um, much more interesting things happening uh, in what I'm doing in the law. That's why I'm here. Perfect. Okay, let's see if we can help you scratch that itch. And I think that's everybody in person. Let's, um, let's go online. Uh, and when I said um, you're in the house, I meant you're just in the room, not that you're in-house attorney. Okay, now then, um, let's, let's go online and then uh, we'll dig into the curriculum. So I'm gonna call people. Um, Alexandra Antoff, is that how? Yeah, pretty good. Hi everyone. Uh, hello. Alexandra. And uh, yeah, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. So I'm saying hi to all of you from Copenhagen at this moment. And uh, yeah, so I work and do research and teach within the field of corporate law, finance law, and tech law. So kind of and the reason why um, i'm very much interested in in joining you and learning from you guys is really to to better understand the the tech background um to connect with even better into the research itself um so yeah very briefly great and and you come recommended from uh, uh, a friend and a member of the advisory board of the mit computational law report elizabeth yes. reneris so yes. we're predisposed in your favor and can't wait to learn more about you and to uh, collaborate with you. Also, did you, do I remember correctly that you had something related to computational law coming up at your university, some event or something? Yeah, so we have, uh, well, different things. So one is a course that I'm running together with two other colleagues that it's called uh, kind of a little bit uh, funnily DigiLawyer. Uh, but teaches our students different kinds of set of skills, including a little bit of coding, but also other skills, more business and tech oriented. And then we have a yearly conference that is called Law, Technology and Trust that I organize in September again this year. So, yeah, so I would definitely want to have... Uh, more discourse there about computational law and whether the computer, computational law is a new field of law or whether it's part of every field of law. So yeah, number of questions, I think. Outstanding, nice. but welcome. Very good. Um, and and uh, let's keep moving down the line here. Um, Farshad, if you could come off mute and say hello. I'm reluctant to unmute people though because I don't oh, know what's yeah. going to happen. I've had bad experiences. <laughs> uh, Fashad, yes, you're, you're quite um, faint. So if you could maybe speak up a little. So yes, thank you. Um, I should be better now. Yes, yep. we, we can hear you well now. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm also an assistant professor um, uh, in, in Baltimore, Maryland, and at the business school. I, uh, my research has been mainly on uh, age law, alternative dispute resolution, um, and international economic law, but more and more it's, uh, it's, uh, it's shifting towards law and technology. I have some pieces on blockchain, but I'm also working on um, from law and the stat and, and, and uh, essentially AI and machine learning. So I'm, I'm really happy that I'm part of this group. Great, welcome. 
I'm going to ask, are, when you say um, economics, is antitrust or competition law within your wheelhouse? Uh, yes and no. That's not the main focus, but I've analyzed it in the context of dispute resolution and how courts really approach that. But I'm familiar with that area. Okay, great. Um, we, we may, I may call on you. And again, just everyone feel free to just say pass if I ever call on you and you don't feel like talking for any reason. But uh, we may be I'm talking. I'm not an expert. I'll try my best. Yeah. <laughs> we may be talking about new ways uh, on, on Thursday that um, data could inform uh, monitoring, um, you know, what's really happening in markets uh, and maybe new concepts and legal frameworks based on uh, these new information resources we have where we don't have to surmise so much and imply infer so much about what's happening so um, yeah. great so thank you uh, for Shard and uh, welcome and who's up next it looks like um, uh, Megan Ma um, is next uh, up yes hi hi everyone um, my name is Megan uh, I'm uh, a visiting PhD student um, at the Harvard Law School um, and uh, my thesis is focused primarily on uh, translation. Um, so it's kind of the translation um, of, I guess, law that's primarily in natural, descriptive natural language and the implications when that's translated to structured data. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested evidently in computational law. Um, yeah. Right. Very, cool. Very cool. Welcome. I don't know if he probably didn't mention it as usual, but Brian got his PhD in linguistics um, here at MIT. So <clears throat> maybe we should arrange a cup of tea or something later while yeah. you're in Cambridge and get really geeky. Yeah, come down to the seaport to the lab. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm actually doing a PhD in law, so I need as much help as I can in linguistics. So. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Okay, let's hack. Um, thank you and welcome. And so now let's see who's next is Natalie Knowlton. I think you skipped. Oh, did we skip Michael? I'm sorry, I skipped Michael Jeffrey. Michael Jeffrey. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Jeffrey. I am a corporate lawyer in Australia, um, specializing primarily in mergers and acquisitions and corporate law. Um, it's a uh, nice, uh, well, 6 a.m. Here in, here in Australia, so nice and bright early start for the next few days. Um, in my interest in this space, uh, look, with, with corporate and M&A being fairly document intensive, most of my, um, most of my work in the computational law space has really been focusing on uh, contract automation and uh, document generation so far. And uh, we introduced uh, DocAssemble into our practice about six months ago. And so that's been an interesting, um, uh, an interesting path. Uh, but look, keen to look into other areas as well and just generally open to any other ideas of working, um, working smarter and more efficiently. Outstanding. We love DocAssemble. Um, it, it it's just, a, yeah, it's a great system. Have you been experimenting with community.lawyer, kind of no code overlay for that? Uh, we're actually uh, using uh, the uh, document overlay at the moment. Um, so, which uh, look, I, I use that aspect. So it certainly helps to speed up some of the initial build process of the interviews. But um, uh, outside that, it's sometimes it's sometimes it's custom coding as well. Great. So we'll, we'll have some. Um, we'll have a little exercise on Thursday with Community Lawyer where we can we can hack some stuff. So. Um, Great. So I think that you're really active in that and maybe can help show us how you've been using Doc Assemble at that point. Sure. Great. Thank you and welcome. Um, so, next up, we've got now finally, we have Natalie Knowlton. Sorry to scare you twice by putting you on the spot, but uh, 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 it's time. No worries. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. you're good. Great. Sound. My name is Natalie Knowlton. I work at a legal think tank uh, research institute at the University of Denver. And my work really focuses on access to justice, court simplification, and attorney re-regulation. I'm interested in this course because we have this tendency in law, of course, to look backwards and, and courts are just catching up with what was popular 10 years ago with respect to technology. So I'm trying to figure out what is going to be happening. I think, Brian, you said it really well. Um, that this is, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is an area where we're talking about what could be uh, as opposed to what might not be right now. 
And I think that's really important as we start thinking about access to justice solutions. Definitely. Here, here. Um, great. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and who's next? Is it Enrique? Niha? Niha. Uh, Niha. I think you go by Hi. Niha kind of as yeah. your nickname. Zoom filled in my full name. I don't know how it got it. But yes, hi, this is Neha. I am a former engineering student, former patent agent, former law student, and now I work at a legal tech startup, and I'm really interested in computational law. I've also been volunteering on the side for a Code for Boston project where we're trying to help people expunge their criminal records, so another facet of approaching how to use technology in law. So I find this whole area very interested and I'm excited to see what's coming up. Great, nice. thanks, welcome. And uh, it, hopefully if it meets your schedule, you can come in person uh, one of the days as well. And, yes, uh, definitely, I'll definitely try. Okay. Um, who's next? I think that's is that it. everybody? Uh, is there anybody online who we didn't, who hasn't introduced themselves? Okay. All right then. <laughs> so you were promised computational law. Now you're going to get computational law. <clears throat> Shall we dive right in? Or do you, should we start with Brian, or do we want to do our thing first? It doesn't matter to me. I think. Do your thing. What makes sense? I kind of want to hear from Brian. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. He just says such great stuff. Okay. Now you got to go to share. No. Oh. So. Um, so actually, I can say something uh, while we're segueing. Um, I, I asked, so Brian Ulysny, thanks, is also a member of the Board of Advisors for the MIT Computational Law Report, this new publication that we launched uh, last month. And, um, and he's going to talk about tax. And in the Computational Law Telegram channel, we've been having a little discussion about something new that's happening with the Internal Revenue Service here in the United States. Uh, they have recently um, lifted a prohibition that they've had for some years um, uh, uh, with um, industry uh, to um, basically limit um, free filing software. Um, so there's some limits on that right now. Um, and there had been a voluntary, I think, restraint of some type for the, where the IRS has um, refrained from putting out um, their own um, kind of open public um, filing software um, so as not to compete with industry. Um, and so they ha I just read and um, distributed an article in, from ProPublica where the, the, uh, indicated the IRS is lifting those constraints and they're uh, requ requiring, I think, the Intuit and others to um, have more um, standard naming conventions for their free file software and to make it you know, more conspicuous and easy to access. And the part that caught my eye, which we were talking about, is the IRS is also now working on their own public free filing software. Um, so in addition to that just being, I'm just gonna say, without getting too political on behalf of MIT, which is uh, you know, educational nonprofit and doesn't, <laughs> I'm not here to take political positions. I think as a matter of public policy, uh, this is, very beneficial, um, and uh, and it also has an interesting dimension for computational law. Uh, so just to set the table a little bit for what we're about to hear and talk about, you, you might tax is an area of law, an internal revenue code, um, and and regulation and all sorts of um, enforceable uh, um, administrative guidance as well. Um, that's written primarily is narrative right now, like um, um, human natural language. Um, much of it, however, is very amenable to expressing itself as code. And to demonstrate that, you could use like TurboTax, for example, and any number of you know, enterprise uh, um, packages to, uh, to do tax prep and filing as well uh, and for business uh, filings. And so, so this code is um, fairly well, um, positioned to be expressed as as computer um, machine readable code and when the IRS is writing code to do the filings it's even closer to um, a, to a government agency now promulgating law as code 
computational law system. It's a computational law system. Uh, and, uh, and so you could imagine, you know, perhaps a next step might be once, uh, once the IRS is, um, deploys their software and it's been you know, used for a few years and becomes more stable, uh, then um, opening up perhaps, for example, a series of APIs, um, interfaces, so that other people could have their own software public, open source, or, or proprietary, but it basically goes through the same APIs and may have the same types of uh, um, kind of, um, you know, form validation and other types of verification, which could also be um, public, um, so that you could actually see uh, for a matter of, as a matter of interoperability and just to kind of conformance of your code, whether it's conforming with, with what the IRS expects. This is another way to express tax law as a computational system. Um, and you could imagine not long after that, once it's an API, creating you know, business types so that it's collecting and preserving um, all the data, that their financials that would be relevant for tax, but then also for other types of financial management in a way that natively is ready to support the sorts of analytics and data um, um, uh, interop, um, like with filing and reporting, uh, that's going to be necessary as part of the information. Um, and so th this, this is a little sliver of, uh, in one context, which is the tax context of how we, what we imagine computational law is and how it, how it may play out. So there may not be a better fit in tax law for computation than VAT and value added tax. And, uh, and I think if I'm not mistaken, that's what Brian's going to oh, in tell part, us about. In part, in but part. not all. Okay, so not Brian, all. take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, so I think this is a, this is a, you know, absolutely a great place to start a computational law uh, workshop because, yeah, I mean, uh, tax laws is, if we think, if computational law is law um, as algorithm, then that's what tax law is, right? It's just saying it, it provides these rules to, to you know, that, that uh, in some deterministic way, hopefully, um, tell you how much you owe the government uh, based on, you know, for income tax, your income, for VAT, uh, for the value add in transactions and so on. So, um, so you know, like every computational system, um, there's, there's sort of two aspects. There's the ontology part. So here I have uh, some, uh, a little snippet from the 1040 instructions about what constitutes a child, right? So, so that's, that's part of the ontology that you need to, uh, of, you need to figure out, you need to specify what things are. So what counts as a child? Well, a child has to be your son, daughter, stepchild, or foster child under age 19 by the end of 2018 for, uh, I guess, this the previous year. Um, and it has to be younger than you or your spouse, um, curiously. I never would have sort of thought about that, but. Uh, uh, so what if I were to go into like um, stasis for, <laughs> and well, stop like biological the, aging? With, okay, we'll come back to that. That's like the, that's like the fertile octogenarian uh, exception to the rule against perpetuities, which is a yeah, tale for right. That's day. an oldie but a goodie. Oh, right. That's wow. a good one. <laughs> so um, yeah, so so the government gives you the you know these out these details about uh, you know uh, these rules of the ontology of what counts as a child, and then there's all kinds of other things you know like was your child enrolled in in a school? It was he a full time he or she a full time student over the past year, and so on. You have to uh, make all those kinds of uh, determinations about what the thing is, and then, oops, uh, and then there's all sorts of um, rules. So here's uh, here's this is a a, a, a snippet from uh, Thomson Reuters guide to the corporate um, uh, tax law that uh, the corporate part of the tax law in 2018 that was changed. That has to do with um, uh, uh, depreciation deduct deductions for automobiles. So once you determine what it what that this thing is an automobile, then certain rules apply to it. So it says you know that uh, 
the certain depreciation allowances or um, um, based on you know what year the thing is built and so on and, and then it, it cites which part of the law this comes from so you know you've got ontology and you've got rules and together those things then uh, deterministically produce um, result for how much tax you owe and as Daza said you know so uh, TurboTax is uh, an example of a um, you know so the IRS basically provides this computational artifact, the tax form, for you to calculate your um, uh, taxes. And you know, so essentially it's a sort of paper and pencil computer. So you know, you store numbers in these buffers, uh, these, these fields, and then you, know, you subtract these from this, and then in, by doing all of this, uh, you end up with your, your final tax determination. Obviously, you know, a lot of that can be uh, automated, and so you know, uh, people like Intuit have have automated this for uh, your personal income tax, and so you upload some some of your documentation, like your W two form. You answer a bunch of questions. Um, it says, you know, based on I, so I've determined that this is your income, so therefore your tax burden. Um, you know, your sort of um, prima facie tax tax burden is this and then then it goes walks you through doing all these deductions and then says you know what well, your actual tax bill is this and and then that's what and then allows you to file it with the government um, so similarly uh, you know and I'm not gonna uh, advertise TR products I promise but um, uh, TR for among other people has a, as a corporate version of this so it's ingesting data um, into the system, uh, determining you know what each um, account uh, in the the your up you know interfacing with the the data represents. Oh, so these are you know this is a payroll expense. This these are office supplies. These are my automobile rentals. These are travel expenses, uh, and so on. And then it cranks through all of the uh, the arithmetic. And, and determines what uh, the corporate tax um, is going to be. Um, so, you know, so, ta so tax is pretty straightforward that way in that it, it does um, lend itself to um, this sort of um, computation. But so one question that, you know, we should ask is, um, why is a human still needed in, the, in this loop? You know, wouldn't it be possible to simply upload uh, sufficient documentation or doesn't the government already have access to sufficient documentation that it should be able to just uh, you know take your W-2 and, and various other things um, you know uh, registrar documents from universities your automobile registration and so on and just be able to calculate the tax that you owe why should you have to do it why should any human being have to um, do this well the answer seems to be that there's, you know, some subjective determination about a lot of, uh, you know, the, these values that we haven't been able to eliminate yet. But, um, you know, uh, we should think about to what extent it would be possible to automate more and more of these things that the TurboTax is able to do by, you know, up by your updating, you're uploading your W-2 form and so on. So that's topic number one. Um, so that, that's about uh, you know, income tax and corporate income tax as a computational system. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, VAT. Can I, can I just raise a little? Yeah, something? yeah, sure. So <clears throat> on the one hand, of course, we don't want to have a needless burden of um, you know, manual computation for things like taxes, because mm -hmm. in addition to how much of a bummer it is to pay taxes. We shouldn't be tortured with having to figure out, you know, how to apply these um, Byzantine algorithms. But um, uh, so that that makes sense, and that I think is like a, a core use case for more automation. On the other hand, when the way that you left it, I thought maybe was worth just putting another word or two on where the human in the loop would be, especially the human who would be due taxes and maybe wants to double check some of the um, subtle assessments are made uh, about. How much tax was was due or 
whether they might want to look at having a more or less aggressive posture and how they interpret things. So where is the idea that there'd still be the human, like the taxpayer or someone else in the loop? Or, or were you really envisioning like a purely completely automated system? Like some jurisdictions, the government and just informs you how much tax is due because they already have access to all the information. Like where, what, what were you saying there? I'm not really taking a position. I'm just um, wondering to what extent uh, current U.S. taxes could be fully automated. And, uh, you know, and potentially, of course, if things are fully automated and there's an explanation, then you could look at the explanation and say, oh, you know, no, I, I object. That's how property taxes generally work, right? So you get your property tax bill, you have the ability to say, no, based on these other comparable properties, I'm paying too much. I protest, they come and, and they check and you can win or lose. Um, so you could go towards that kind of system. Um, yeah, I think uh, kind of hitting on something you'd said before as well, you know, I think more of those, uh, tax uh, kind of like measuring uh, sort of jobs where you're trying to calculate after the fact are going to be shifted to like trying to like figure out how it fits ahead of the fact. So it'll be more like ingesting into the system instead of trying to untangle the system. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe also choosing what algorithms or what templates or what, what, what based on how you want to interpret um, like how aggressive you want to be yeah. with um, tax avoidance. Um, you, you, one could imagine choosing different algorithms or different models or setting parameters or thresholds on software differently. Maybe something like that on the front end. Yeah. Do, do, could we could we open up to Brendan before you march Absolutely, forward to that? Absolutely, yeah, sure. Um, and then in order to do this successfully, I think everybody should be able to hear Brendan because he frequently says great things. So it's, okay, I'll, I'm going to do the mic one. So Christmas list is wireless lavalier. Uh, so it's wonderful. So what I hear all three of you saying is it's really about simulation. And what is amazing in all this is that when you look at you know what gets built on top of all this stuff, it's phenomenal. Right? Because then you can think about you know all the meta decisions you can make with the business logic, you know, should you do this in this jurisdiction, should you do that in that jurisdiction, you know, all the fun stuff. That's mm -hmm. all I want to say. You guys are on some. Okay. Um, Tom. Uh, yeah, this is Todd. I just want to add that there's been some uh, resistance to uh, having the U.S. Uh, IRS automatically do people's taxes and present them with a proposed a bill and calculations, particularly from companies that make money selling the software. And they've successfully lobbied Congress to pass laws that block the IRS from doing this. Uh, the IRS has also been historically reluctant to release data and information about uh, uh, the information it collects. So for instance, it uh, issues private advisory, uh, opinions to individual taxpayers and doesn't make those widely available. So some people have access to them, some people don't. Uh, it collects uh, data on millions of nonprofits and has that in electronic machine readable form, but had to be sued to make it available and did so only reluctantly. So there's a lot of resistance both from industry and from agencies themselves in uh, automating this, some of these processes, or making the information available and transparent. So that's some of the obstacles as well. And did you did you hear my reference to the ProPublica piece? Last yeah, week? So the Are Pro, you familiar with that? Yeah. So the ProPublica piece, if you distributed it, goes into more detail about how uh, industry players like Intuit uh, have re have lobbied Congress to block the IRS from essentially taking over. Uh, tax computation and giving people the option of accepting the IRS's calculations or modifying them, and, which most people would probably do and, and, and significantly reduce the amount of money that industry players make. Thank you. Um, what a great point. Um, and it, There's some online points as well. Um, the chat. 
it really brings up the point that when, when we're talking about this in a public law context, in addition to the algorithms, we really have to talk about architecture yep. and how, how many Policy. layers of that stack um, need to be open and public, and then where is it appropriate to have things private? Uh, people's, in, you know, some individual financial things should be private. Should some of that in the aggregate be public? Should the algorithms that are being used to assess your tax be public? These are some of the um, some of the core questions, and this is all within the scope of computational law. We have somebody online who is seeking to speak and go. Or are we supposed to read? Yeah, keep, uh... So the last okay, we're going to read it. Oh, why don't you read it? Okay. So uh, so this was from a little bit ago, but it was uh, Andre talking about how adoption of... Oh, yeah. So th that was to the point about uh, how can you have somebody who's, uh, you know, a child that's older, or uh, I think it's a dependent, right? That's older than... What was the term? It was a child. So child. Well, you can imagine that if you're... Uh, if you marry someone, you're, you're 18 and your spouse is 30, that they yeah. could have a child that's older than you. Yeah. Um, um, fair point. Yeah. And also, obviously, ad adoption, uh, like yeah. straight up adoption. Yeah, that's true. For it. Yeah. And, and then he has sticking a, with stasis. Also. He, he has another point uh, as well that I think is really good, where this, the, this notion that, you know, when an individual submits their tax forms, it's kind of a voluntary act by the taxpayer um, so so there's a question about what do you think um, about you know the voluntariness of this and how that relates to kind of automating it and you know declaring it down upon everybody yeah. no I mean there's a, there's a whole there's a whole lot of policy implication or you know a whole lot of policy choices to be made here um, you know so currently I think I read on the way over here that only Four tenths of one percent of individual tax returns are going to be audited this year, or this will have been audited this past year. So we've kind of made this decision basically to to audit nearly no one, but then re require you know have everyone do their own taxes. Um, and you know, there's a from a policy perspective, would the revenues be greater if uh, you know the the taxes were just done for people and they could. Um, object and, and so on and also um, forever it's worth in the United States if you you know voluntarily choose to not file taxes and the uh, tax authorities at the federal and state levels at least believe that you had taxes owed um, they will eventually although it may take you know a couple few years um, they will assess what they think your taxes owed are and they'll send you a form and they will inform you of that mm -hmm. give you a period That's of time good. to object and then if you don't object, um, then they will consider them to have been owed and not paid. And then, you know, what happens after that? Like the, the processes take take put. But it, this does, it, it just, let's just for, put a pin in it for now, other than to say this raises basic questions about the the social compact and the role of citizens in government. Uh, and uh, and how do we translate forward, um, you know, autonomy and, and freedoms, as well as the obligations uh, in administrative state and appropriately, um, uh, appropriately when, when they're all digital and that does change some that, that will change some things uh, oh uh, yeah we have one more in the room and then and then let's forward go for I just want to raise the concern that yeah, closer. We, I just want to raise the concern that you really have to think about the Fox and the house problem yeah. Could you extract just to connect the dots? Well, the IRS does have a regulatory function, and you know, normally we don't allow a person who is the regulator to also be the re on the other end of the transaction. So we just really want to be careful that those functions are ultimately separate, or you lose, or at least you run the risk of losing an important kind of oversight. Beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Um, it was. It may have been a brief comment, but a very important one. And uh, I was trying to get at that a little bit with uh, the question of autonomy and the role between you know citizens and the governed and the, the governed gov those that govern. Um, so I mean, the the quintessential definition of a totalitarian state is holding all roles and all of the cards. And so that you know, it really does raise the question of 
how far we want them to go. And maybe next year or, or in the next semester or two, we should explore what an API would look like for taxes to see you know, how much of this still provides um, you know, proper decision making for the tax filer um, versus um, um, expropriating um, a lot of all of those decisions uh, by, by the regulating entity. Um, Cause I, I could, I could build an API where you can build the software, but like it or not, it's never going to process unless you do it in my way. Um, or I can build an API where you're literally just reporting the results of your tabulations based on your decisions, which may be more subjective. And so um, yeah, the questions don't go away with, with computation. In some cases, they're, they may just become more explicit, uh, but um, computational, these systems are becoming. And so now is the time to begin to come to terms with that and understand how to express law computationally and then how should we be expressing it? But, um, first things first here, we wanted to see if we can get really good at expressing different rules and different systems computationally so that we can distinguish and then, um, you know, perhaps uh, engineer in a wiser way. Brian. Got another chat. Oh, another One chat. Last One last chat. Um, okay. Clicky, clicky. Natalie, uh, regarding her point about the regulatory issue, this is exactly what we encounter with lawyers. Yeah. The, the lawyer in the hen house. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, okay, back to you, Brian. Uh, cool, Brian. Okay, so, uh, so, so the second topic I wanted to talk about was uh, you know, computational issues with um, VAT, so value added tax. Uh, so, not, not uh, such a big, not a big thing here. But uh, in Europe and uh, now in the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council and the Middle East and other jurisdictions, um, it, you don't have to worry just about property tax and income tax, but also value added tax. So just uh, you know, very, very quickly. So value added tax means that at every step um, as a, you know, a product is enhanced to bring it to market, uh, there's a tax burden uh, that's that's passed along and then uh, as you um, pay the tax forward, you get the tax, uh, the, the, the person at the previous step gets the tax back. Um, so that, that's a, a, a well-known thing in the EU and I'm just gonna quickly show this video from. Um, now it's gone on, stolen from you every year by criminals committing VAT fraud, taking advantage of a broken VAT system. As to the mass, 100 euros times 500 million Europeans. That's 50 billion euros every year. How many schools will that pay for? Lots. How do the criminals do it? They set up shady companies in Europe to steal your tax money. Here's an example. Company A sells mobile phones to a company in another country in the EU. No VAT charged because cross-border sales shouldn't incur VAT. Still with us? Good. Across the border, company B sells the phones to company C in its own country and charges VAT to company C. Company B is supposed to pay this VAT back to the treasury, but it doesn't. It takes the VAT and disappears with the money. But if company C then resells the same phones back to company A and applies the tax credit, the cycle is complete. Told you it was complicated. The point is, they all disappear before we can catch them. It's called VAT carousel fraud. The same goods go round and round like a carousel. All money is stolen. And it's happening a lot. And because of the current rules, it's really not easy to catch them. Some of these guys have been caught, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Are you mad by now? You should be. Some criminals use your money to buy sports cars and villas. It may even be used to fund other criminal and perhaps terrorist activities. The rules of the game need to change. That's what the European Union is doing. Changing the European VAT system so we can stop criminals in their tracks and put this money back in your pocket. Let's stop the carousel. Okay, so this... Oop. Yeah. I'm carousel-old. <laughs> uh, oops, oh, wait a minute, so there we go. All right, so, so, um, so that, that, that's, that was a little video about uh, what's called carousel fraud uh, in VAT. Um, so I won't belabor that, but um, so, so here's, uh, so Thompson Reuters has uh, invested in a company and, and done some uh, work with a startup called uh, Sumido which is an Amsterdam-based um, startup 
which has a, a blockchain-based solution to eliminate carousel tax fraud that it is uh, piloting with the Dutch government. Um, so I'll just quickly play this. Oops. Uh, oh, I see. I have to click on this. Um, yeah, I know. I'm addicted to tabs. It's Oops. fairly easy. Just twist it. To yourself filling out a VAT return. It's fairly easy. Just fill in the amount of VAT you wish to pay or receive. Not only is it easy, but it's also sensitive to fraud, worth 50 billion euros per year in the EU alone. Now that's a lot of money. So what can we do to solve this? In the battle against VAT fraud, blockchain technology might be the solution we've been waiting for. Our blockchain solution, named TX++, allows companies to register an encrypted fingerprint of the invoice. By not storing actual invoice data, the risk of data breaches is eliminated. And because of the decentralized network architecture, there is no single point of failure. So risks of system failures are minimized. Can you see the bigger picture? Imagine a VAT system which provides benefits for both the public and the private sector. It can save billions without risking confidentiality. A blockchain-based invoice registration system has the capacity to significantly tackle missing trader fraud, while at the same time guaranteeing taxpayer confidentiality. So how does it work? This invoice registration system can be coupled with any existing accounting package. Companies can also easily register invoices through a web portal. A fingerprint of the invoice is generated, timestamped, and encrypted. As a result of this simple procedure, fraudulent reporting cannot go undetected anymore. The encrypted fingerprint of the invoice is By registering invoice fingerprints in a public network, society will progress from a double entry to a triple entry accounting system. Okay, so, um, uh, so I think it's um, so, so, so the idea there is, is clear enough if you understand a little bit about blockchain. So um, by having all of these invoices uh, be encrypted and just, uh, and just uh, putting on, this, on the blockchain the parts that are needed in order to, you know, basically the parties and the amounts, um, in order to calculate the VAT, uh, because of the immutability of the blockchain and because of the decentralized uh, nature of the blockchain, then everyone can be assured that all of all of the the correct VAT has been paid. Uh, there's no possibility of of the you know the one party not paying their tax the the VAT into the treasury and then getting a refund for that uh, tax and making and and disappearing. So um, you know that this seems like a promising solution that. Um, solves some of the problems that we saw with uh, you know, the income tax, meaning that because all of, the, all of the data that's relevant to calculating the tax is, is computationally available on the blockchain, uh, that's not the case with uh, US income tax and so on because there's all these um, external data pieces that we need to know about, like when was the car, when did the car originate and so on. But uh, with VAT, all of this can be uh, calculated simply on the basis of these invoices, which can be cryptographically just fingerprinted on the blockchain uh, and um, used as the basis for this complete calculation. So that's, that seems um, like a promising idea. Yep. Oh. No, no uh, this is an, the, the next topic. So that's perfect. Uh, yeah, sure, great. Um, so what's pretty interesting that I've come across is the idea that with uh, zero-knowledge proofs, 
you could prove the you know the identity of the of uh, an existence of a value mm -hmm. right so you'd be able to know that a tax um is owed without knowing anything else about the transaction and i think once these things get scaled up you know the way we conceptualize uh transactions and their taxation is going to dramatically change because the information uh, that we need to know about taxable things uh, is going to be fundamentally different in the future. Then can I, can I um, augment that a little? Sure. <clears throat> so with zero knowledge proof, this is a perfect example. One of the elements that you would look to prove for the amount owed would also be the identity of the parties that owed it. Um, and I wonder how would, how would blockchain, for example, get us to like this vision of a legal entity identifier or some other way to identify like in the carousel fraud, what was the legal entity, the business mm -hmm. or the person um, who had the obligation in the first place? And then how do we make sure that that whole identity system doesn't become, you know, itself like a tool of a tyrannical, um, you know, entity that might use it against us? Yeah, I I can't speak to the tyran tyrannical uh, <laughs> use case, but Tyrannosaurus um, um, Fox in the hen house. Tyrannosaurus Lex. I I mean, so the identifiers, you know, as as you as you know very well, are are you know um, these pseudonyms, right? Um, uh, so on the one hand, there's uh, the anonymity that's that all pseudonyms provide. There there's systems like these decentralized identifiers that not only provide this pseudonymous identifier, but also uh, provide the ability to, to verify that that is your identifier cryptographically and that you control that doesn't rely on some uh, intermediate um, like uh, the DNS system that says, you know, in order to um, uh, dereference an identifier like your LinkedIn profile URL you depend on this whole infrastructure of the DNS system to, to say, oh, to, to find out what's behind that URL, uh, I need to, I, re, I route it to this uh, uh, you know, server and it, and it produces this, this information, which may or may not be correct, and depending on it, whether someone uh, messed up the DNS routing. Right. Uh, with, the, with the decentralized identifier, I control what information is dereferenced and I, that's always under my control and it's always verifiably me. Yeah. So that seems like uh, also a giant step forward. So just for, uh, for the, so you can do this at home, um, you could um, learn more about what Brian was just referencing uh, by searching DIDs or decentralized I identity. Um, and there's a worldwide web consortium um, set of specifications on how this could happen and the mechanism by which people can acquire you know, kind of sovereignty in a sense over their own individual IDs uh, in a decentralized way uh, mm -hmm. would be with public key cryptography. So um, you would um, have a key pair in initially and that's how you could prove um, that you were an entity um, that had a pseudonym um, that connected in this case to say a tax um, transaction uh, without giving up your individual your ID to start with and then one other little distinction here Which is important. We were talking about architecture and stacks earlier the DNS system the domain name say the domain name server system um, is distributed um, You know, there's a lot there's a number of domain name servers, but it's not decentralized. It's mm. very centralized It's it's very hierarchical um, uh, by contrast, and so in the United States, um, if it was if it was an identity system, that would start looking a lot like a national ID. Um, we are allergic here in the United States to national IDs. Um, same in Great Britain, uh, for for various reasons. Um, the the this concept of this um, alternative way to have decentralized and, and distributed I identifiers may be a way to to. Um, create a capability of having verifiable and like, you know, provable identity, uh, but in a way that's decentralized and maintains um, autonomy and like things like civil liberties and, and other, uh, other you know, beneficial kind of um, attributes uh, to the individuals and companies. I just want to unpack some of what you just said there. Cool.
Yeah, and I, I should also point out that uh, Thomson Reuters is on the working groups for both the decentralized identifiers and uh, verifiable credentials. Yeah, and of course, we, we don't uh, endorse um, individual companies at MIT, but I'm just going to say I'm proud to be wearing the Thomson Reuters hat today uh, Ooh, because that, that comes think, close to an endorsement. Because <laughs> that, because that's you know having a big companies as well as you know civil libertarians and academics think about um, decentral things like decentralized identity is critical to getting it right, and then also for it to being acceptable and adoptable at scale. So kudos to you and your company for for being involved in that. Oh, well, thank you very much. All right, so topic number three. Uh, so uh, the, the last, in the last topic, we, we talked about how blockchain could potentially be used to solve uh, some tax fraud problems. Uh, this is the counterpart. Uh, what are we going to do about taxing blockchain-based uh, assets, so cryptocurrencies and so on? So in, uh, you'll notice in when you fill out your 2019 tax form that question zero, the, top, the question at the very top of your tax form, is going to ask you at any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? So I don't know if that means SNH green stamps uh, as well. That's an ontology question, but uh, that is. Uh, interestingly, the, the very first thing you have to fill out in this form. We can leave that to the linguists. Can we, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, there's a lot of things that... Uh, the question was, what about be, frequent flyer miles? The, uh, the uh, instructions say. But in any case, so, so there's a lot of, you know, so, so uh, if you've got uh, cryptocurrency assets... Oh, actually, I should, I'm sorry. Let me just say, um, there, is, uh, there are working definitions now, I think, in a... In a Cross, cross agency regulatory group for virtual currency, digital currency, um, digital assets. Um, so, I'm not mistaken, the SEC, CFTC, IRS, um, other components of Treasury um, are, are starting to get together with um, with um, common definition sets for these. And so, I am almost positive the IRS has a formal definition of. Of, uh, of that term and that it's increasingly being used as a common glossary set across regulators. Mm. And just forever it's worth, um, you can yourself go to mit.edu forward slash blockchain and see an initiative that um, we did, um, or this computational law initiative like three years ago now or so with Congress where we um, convened a bunch of regulators and congressional types and a lot of businesses and blockchain people and standards organizations to look at coming up with common terms. Um, so what would be a legislative and regulatory? What would we mean when we said blockchain? What would we mean when we said smart contract? And we didn't get down to virtual currency, but in subsequent years uh, that they have. Well, maybe you could speak to yeah, the, the definition of a crypto case. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Wait, uh, oh. that, that, that's coming that, up. That's, that's Brian's that's the next segment. Oh, man. The taxation. <laughs> right. Talk yeah, about tax and crypto kitties. Tax and crypto kitties. Yeah. That's, all right. Um, so anyway, so uh, just point out that there are, are emerging solutions. So Thomson Reuters just uh, partnered with a company called Verity, a startup that um, does basically uh, accounting of crypto assets so that uh, to enable, you know, this next step where the, those kinds of transactions are going to be routinely taxed. And so you're going to need auditable, uh, records of, uh, you know, to do capital gains on crypto uh, transactions, for example, you need to know like how much it was worth to begin with and how much you sold it for and all of that and, and tracking that in a reliable way is going to be increasingly important. So the, Verity does this across, they, they have this uh, legible technology that tracks, uh, uh, you know, a variety of cryptocurrencies and across different exchanges and so on. And then finally, so th so that's uh, that's the, the the counterpart to uh, blockchain is solution uh, cryptocurrencies as problem. Uh, then there's just the the my last topic is just keeping up with computationally keeping up with changes in in tax laws. So um, uh, uh, an intern that we had last summer, a student at at Duke, 
uh, did a very interesting project for us. So one of the things that, um, that businesses have to deal with is uh, changes in sales tax regulation. So, uh, you know, states and cities and uh, frequently update their what's, what's, uh, has sales tax applied to it. Uh, then there's also this whole idea of sales tax holidays. And all of those um, changes need to be then, you know, computationally implemented at your cash register so that the sales tax is correctly applied to this category of products and not this. And so then you need to have the sort of whole ontology of products and what falls under what uh, category that's specified in the legislation and, and so on. So what this, what this intern did for us was used um, vector-based word encodings as a way to identify uh, when the legislation spoke about uh, different categories of things that would be taxed or not taxed during sales tax holidays, uh, mapping those to an ontology of, of sales tax, um, of, of product categories for sales tax that Thomson Reuters maintains and then uh, ships to its uh, customers so that they can you know, uh, uh, do that calculation at the point of sale. So here's, for example, uh, this was a um, uh, sales tax change in, for Iowa, and it said simply things like digital audio visual works, uh, digital audio works, ringtones, digital books, um, uh, you know, digital greeting cards, would now be, I forget if, if this is that they were going to be taxed or not taxed. I think this meant that they were going to be taxed. So then you have to figure out, well, you know, what, uh, what counts as a digital audio work and so on. Um, and so, so he used, um, you know, current techniques in, in natural language processing to map these natural language terms to uh, these product categories, which enables uh, the, the people who are doing this mapping to be much more effective um, at, uh, at doing these, these mappings. So that's, that's really all I have to say here. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, uh, tax is obviously very computational. Um, how much of it can be automated in part depends on how much information is available to the system. A lot of the income tax um, information is sort of external to anything that you might be, you know, sort of conceivably um, brought to bear in an automation. Can blockchain help prevent some tax fraud? Well, we've seen in, in that that it seems uh, like that's a, a very good use case. Uh, what about taxing crypto assets? That's sort of a, a, a technology that's, that's just starting. And then um, are there also computational techniques that we can use to help us keep up with all of these changes in the tax law? So uh, al algorithmically keeping track of updates to the tax algorithm um, is a second order sort of task. Right here. So could you imagine, for example, in the future, um, if let's say the IRS had an API um, for um, people that wanted to um, roll their own tax prep software or wanted to create an uh, open source project or, or like the next version of TurboTax. Um, <clears throat> could you imagine that um, they might publish their API and eventually um, um, do it formally as regulation uh, the way the SEC has published their um, XBRL uh, filings for, um, for um, publicly traded companies? And then could you imagine to your point about looking forward um, that if they were going, not if, but when they up version the API, that they might publish an NPRM, a, a notice of proposed rulemaking, and uh, identify what the new code would be, and maybe even like the test suite, and yeah. how you could come up with software, and then have, you know, however many months for comment from people to say, you know, we think this is fair or unfair, or this is, this breaks some, um, you know, previous version or whatever they would say before they actually finalize the algorithms and the, uh, and the APIs for, for that. And, could, and, and of course, couldn't some of that testing be done algorithmically is what you're getting at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All good points. Oh, what a world that would be. Yeah. Great. Well, Indeed. thanks for your attention.
everybody. That Brian Ulysses, computational <laughs> dude. <laughs> um, okay, so um, let's see. Um, in the just in the afterglow of that presentation, are there any any um, comments or uh, questions or, or ideas about about any of that? Uh, uh, anyone online or okay you're getting some kudos online um, or, or in the room okay we've got one you wanna, can you just, if I hand this to you would you hold it at a steady distance from your mouth sure. okay thanks uh, this question this question is for uh, for cool Brian and <laughs> the question is uh, can you give us a sense at this time, you know, in, you're in a very unique position, and the question is, what are you hearing from uh, the corporate culture in terms of, you know, they're beginning, beginning to uh, grapple and understand these kinds of issues? You know, is there an outcry? Is there, are there interests by some? Who are the, who, who are the players? I don't know, anything. Tell, tell, me, tell me a story. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so interestingly, I think that uh, the whole idea of blockchain, the whole idea of um, the usability of blockchain is, uh, is definitely being embraced by government. So we've been, we've been doing some interesting stuff with uh, customs and border protection, for example, about, um, you know, tracking um, uh, entries of um, shipments and so on via blockchain and the government is sees immediately how much this would make their lives so much easier. Um, so in, in that sense, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the government's always supposed to be way behind it, everything that they're, they're very much, uh, I mean, at, here at MIT, everyone thinks, well, blockchain, oh, that's ancient news. But uh, in, in the government world, you know, I think the certain agencies like the CBP are actually pretty far ahead of, of things. Um, I don't know that too many people are super worried about, uh, you know, in the corporate world about taxation issues around um, cryptocurrencies and things. You know, people are aware that there are issues, but I don't think that anyone's too um, worried about it. Uh, it's not really a mainstream thing for most multinational corporations to hold cryptocurrencies, so. Yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and then there was a question online, I, I believe it was about algorithmic discrimination. So like to, to what extent can some of these, you know, tax systems be, have, you know, almost like a discriminatory effect on um, uh, the way that tax is levied? Do you think it's like greater than it would be as kind of like this static process? Well, I mean, I think this is just a general problem for AI, right? Um, Poorly designed AI systems can uh, lead to discrimination, um, and you know, and there's a there's a role for policy here. Obviously, uh, there's a role for um, you know simulation and so on, and and seeing what would the effect be of of automating people's tax returns um, versus voluntary voluntarily filling them out and so on. Um, so I, I don't, this is not really a particular issue for tax. I think this is just what we have to face with AI and automation everywhere. And we have a clarification on that, and then uh, you, Todd. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't uh, discrimination, it was demonstration. Oh. <clears throat> and the clarification is explaining how exactly the algorithm works in a certain system or software. We can imagine situations in which the automation um, of the tax activities by states could lead to algorithms that the taxpayer could not understand. So this gets to, um, I think technically some people call it interpretability of algorithms, like especially with these black box algorithms that you don't have access to, which Todd was mentioning, uh, some of them uh, like proprietary or classified or something, or, or ones where maybe have perfectly good access, but nobody can figure out what's going on and it gets down to, uh, it can be comprehended, uh, much less replicated. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's certainly true that there are a lot of AI systems where you can't figure out how it's 
making the term, you know, the determination. Uh, but, you know, automating tax is not like a, a deep learning system. It's very straightforward arithmetic, um, <laughs> right? So it, it should very well be explainable how you, how the calculation is. If you have, if you have, if you determined. have trouble explaining it, you're doing something wrong. Right. That's, yeah. <laughs> right. The world needs a lot more high school math teachers and science teachers. Thank God for David Colarusso yeah. and people like that. Um, Todd, did you want to? Okay. We have a microphone for you. And I just implore you to keep it an even distance from your mouth. All right. I have a follow up question um, for Uncle Brian on cryptocurrency and blockchain. Yes. Uh, so there's widespread use uh, by Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrency. Uh, by ransomware, black hat hackers, and there's a real concern by a lot of government agencies that it makes it easier for people to hide their identity mm -hmm. and uh, get away with fraud. Mm -hmm. So I would be really interested in how, if you could explain how the implementations of blockchain that you're thinking of wouldn't allow people to uh, hide their identity and then disappear as they are with a VAX carousel, VAT carousel, and instead uh, there would be more transparency and ability to track down people who don't pay their fair share. Right. You. Um, you, you seem like you want to say something. I, I was going to say, I, I, I think with, uh, you know, the, you look at the Silk Road marketplace, they've been able to kind of uh, take the uh, entries into the Bitcoin blockchain and actually figure out, um, you know, different people who have like continuous uh, use on that blockchain or uh, in the kind of illicit marketplace. And, and so I, I think there, there's that way to do it, but it involves knowing what the, the public key is, right? And so once you know the public key or once you can see, oh, this, uh, this public key continually engages in the carousel fraud, you, you would have a way that you could identify that public key as being like a bad actor um, for continued use. Right. Um, so I, in, in all of these blockchain schemes, there's sort of, you know, different, differing levels of anonymity. I mean, some blockchain Bitcoin is meant to be completely, you know, to allow this, these anonymous transactions. Um, someone in, in the VAT, uh, scenario, for example, is is the the government, and they have they they have the right to know who's who. Uh, whereas for everyone else, that's um, you know these these uh, encrypted values. So that so it preserves privacy in an outward facing way because people who look at the blockchain can don't know who's trading with who. So it preserves those trade secrets, but the government has to know who to send the, the bill to or uh, to go after. So they're, they're able to, you know, identify those people. Um, so, so different blockchains will have different roles and, um, you know, that, that's how you would get, that's, yeah. address those, those problems. I think my assumption is all the best identity fraud of these new systems hasn't yet even been invented. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to be in a, in, in a, in a time of escalating, you know, measures and countermeasures until, until we figure out how to do this right. And identities near the bottom of the stack of what we have to get right as we transition, you know, the economy and governance and the society into a, a computational footing. Yeah, um, and, and I linked in uh, the Telegram channel to a Wired article that goes over how you can kind of go back through and look at uh, transactions and kind of start identifying people from Bitcoin. It's amusingly yeah. titled, Your Sloppy Bitcoin Drug Deals Will Haunt You for Years. <laughs> um, not mine. <laughs> not yours. Uh, I mean, the metaphorical you. Um, okay, so um, it, it, any, you have another? I have one other question. Okay. So, Don't worry, uh, cool, Brian, you're off the hook. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, this question actually, one of us. 
this question is is really for the folks online oh yes. and especially the folks who are online and uh, don't pay u.s taxes so i'm very curious as to uh how you're paying your taxes uh in your respective countries and uh, also uh, cryptocurrency taxes my understanding is that paying taxes in every other country in the world except for america is much more streamlined yeah i can uh, jump in there from the australian perspective this is uh, michael jeffrey um the, we've taken a bit of a hybrid approach here where you look the, the australian tax office doesn't um it doesn't make a uh, a determination of what your tax is, but it does pre-populate what your information would be. And if you are, if you have a very simple tax position, um, basically, you know, like you know, you've got a job, you get a salary, and you don't have a whole lot of um, uh, investments or uh, deductions, then most of the time they get it precisely right. It's uh, so you log into the log into the tax system. Um, it will have everything pre-populated for you and the position is just do you agree and submit or is it um, or do you want to challenge or, or modify things so it's uh, you do have the ability to modify it but it is most of the time I've never changed it uh, that's been around for the last two or three years and on the cryptocurrency front the big uh, the big question mark with cryptocurrencies in the last few years has been about whether it is really treated as a currency. Um, and so in Australia, we have a value added tax as well, which is called a GST, um, goods, a goods and services tax. Um, and until about two years ago, dealers or uh, dealers of cryptocurrency would also have to charge, if they were doing it legitimately, they would have to be charging their VAT or GST of 10% on cryptocurrency sales as well. So it wasn't really treated as a, as a currency. Um, so it really didn't, wasn't really effective as a currency because if you were doing it legitimately, you'd be paying paying tax on your transactions as well, um, an extra 10%. So um, that that all changed about, I think it was about 2007. So now it is, look, there, I, don't, I don't see too much in the corporate sense of people using cryptocurrencies, but it is uh, becoming more recognized, at least from a tax perspective, as being a legitimate um, a legitimate currency. Nice. Yeah, I like that aspect of um, of sharing, pre, uh, uh, in particular yeah. sharing all the sources of information that it's being used. I know that the IRS um, frequently, before I do my own taxes, I'll go and ask for my tax transcript and all of the all the income that my um, like consulting clients have has report have reported, just to make sure that it connects with what I thought and that um, no no errors have been made and. And so forth. Yeah, um, I, I think the the pre-population notion actually also gets to the idea of ex, uh, the the demonstration or explainability piece too. So that would be a, a good solution there. Yeah, Michael, did uh, do you do you know what effect did the uh, you know pre-populating or pre-calculating people's taxes have on the tax revenue? Did did it go up or go down? Um, not not sure actually, but like uh, I think. It's one of the few areas where I think that uh, people aren't challenging the government that much. Um, most of the time, most systems that particularly, particularly here that have been introduced from a, where the government is trying to get into a, a technical, it launched some sort of technical play, have been uh, quite, a, quite a failure. But um, this one just seems to work. Um, it's very simple. And I don't hear of many people challenging it or having issues with it um, from a from a privacy or a privacy perspective the, the the tax department here largely has just become a, a big um, most of their job is now um, crawling over data and uh, there's I don't hear of many people having an issue with it Interesting. That's awesome. yeah cool well, Australia is the future <laughs> yep so we should probably in some do, senses. <laughs> we should probably do the class from Australia next time, right? No. Probably. Go, go for it. <laughs> oh no, you're supposed to say yes. We invite you um, uh, to. Okay. Um, so, shall we move forward? I reckon. Okay. So, thank you very much, Brian. Awesome job.
Okay, so now, um, so we did this a little bit out of sequence, um, logically, um, you know, some, like, I guess newspaper people would know even better than I how to present and, and rhetoricians um, things that, that I was taught. You start with something broad and then you go narrower and narrower. I just thought it might be nice to start with a, with a concrete example that hopefully everyone can understand. And what we're gonna do now is broaden it out a little bit because computational law isn't just computational tax. Um, in some ways, like tax is the worst, you know, kind of like um, uh, you know, poster child for a system that we think actually could be quite exciting and could could make things um, substantively better. Um, and so, th this uh, next presentation is based on a overview that Brian and I uh, presented at Relativity Fest. Yeah, in we did a Chicago. version of it too for the Computational Law and Blockchain Festival. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so this is somewhat iterative, but it's kind of like our, uh, this is the stump speech now for uh, basically answering that existential question, what is computational law? And why might I want to love it too? So um, with that, I'm going to now do a little screen share. Oh, I can do it online if you need. Um, okay, how do we do that? Um, I'll go to presentation. Present slides. Share. Share. Desktop. Perfect. Oh. Just one moment. It's having some it's thinking. Right. Want me to do it? Uh Google Chrome. Oh, no. Yeah, you should do it. It's, okay. uh, I'm getting some, because I had to open it in a different browser since I'm doing the iPad. No, the... Okay. All right. One moment. Getting the spinning beach ball of death. Open system preferences. Why does it want me to open system preferences? Oh, that's what I had too. Oh. How do I make this not big? Ah, okay. If you stare at the beach ball too long, it hypnotizes you, so just be careful. Be careful. Okay, it stopped. Now, what do I want to do to allow this? Oh, zoom, do I wanna? Click it or something. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll do that on mine real quick so okay. that we can right. I'll slog. We're great at computers, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. This is what you're about to see. Okay, you got um, it. It's making me quit and get back in. Okay. So. Fine. These computers are a little too smart. Oh, we're trying to reconnect. All right. Let me get back here. Stop that. Boy. I heard the consequences of denying. Okay, um, so for those of you online, we are now, we're trying to get into presentation mode. I wonder if there's another way to do this. Strange. Okay, you can go to mine. I've got it now. Perfect. Okay, right. um, quick, quick check uh, with um, those online. Uh, can you see the slides? This will also tell us what's recording. Okay. Very good. Any anybody online? Yeah, uh, so Neha said yes. Oh yes, very good. Okay, 
off we go. Okay. So this is uh, our talk on the future of legal service delivery, um, where we're kind of looking at the role of interoperable apps and services within the context of law. And uh, I don't know that we can run through this in 15 minutes, so we may go a little bit over time, um, but everybody will be able to watch this at their own convenience later on. Um, and we'll have uh, some little cue notes uh, to where the to where uh, Cool Brian's lecture ended and where ours started so that it's easy to kind of jump back in. Um, so you, you already know about us. Uh, and, and what we kind of, uh, what our uh, assertion is, is that technology kind of increases uh, our potential for uh, delivering services, especially legal services between people every day. Um, there's a lot more data out there now that data can be used, combined, configured in ways that uh, enable more efficient, more transparent uh, legal processes and legal services. And um, so uh, kind of speeding through that, um, you know, Yelp data has been shown to predict health code violations more effectively than uh, the, the existing system. And so, you know, what would that look like for law if we used um, different sorts of legal data to start, uh, you know, addressing problems before or in the in the case of tax, you know, what if we started using data that already existed to kind of pre-populate some of those tax systems? Um, you know, what if we could use Twitter data to track the spread of a contagious disease a little bit better? This is a, um, they, this is a, project that had been done where they were actually able to show, you know, they were able to track the spread of a contagious disease about 80% uh, faster than they were able to with some traditional measures. Um, so the question really becomes, how do we optimize data for law? Um, so last year we had a session on uh, data for legal apps and services with Juan Ramirez from the company in Serio. They're, uh, they work with a lot of e-discovery providers to build custom solutions and workflows um, around the way that that data that the data from e-discovery gets reviewed. So one of their uh, projects involves creating like a GIS layer to visualize where um, uh, I think in a in a pipeline uh, in litigation about a leak in a pipeline, they were able to you know visualize all the different places where people had gone in and worked on the pipeline over time so that they could show that you know they were handling that with the right amount of diligence and uh, they had another app where it was like a almost like a slack bot so that they could automatically do request do requests for um you know some of this different data natively in slack and so it gets a lot to this idea that if you if you turn law into data, you can do a lot more with it, and, uh, and they're doing a really great job of that. Um, in another context, uh, this has been used to evaluate non-disclosure agreements. So this is a company called Law Geeks, and uh, Law Geeks trained, uh, they trained this AI to uh, review uh, non-disclosure agreements for errors. Um, or, you know, not errors, but uh, things that would cause concern. And uh, then they kind of took this, they kind of created this challenge where they pitted the lawyers against, uh, they pitted the AI against a bunch of uh, senior lawyers at big firms, uh, academics, uh, senior GCs at tech companies. And one of the things that they found was, you know, the AI spotted issues 9% better than the lawyers did. Um, but the, I think, uh, most, uh, the, the, the craziest fact is the AI could do it in about 26 seconds, where the uh, average time taken by a lawyer was 92 minutes. And so, uh, so you know, that, that kind of uh, shows uh, the potential of uh, kind of representing law and legal processes as data. Um, so, and, and this one, I think it's especially, especially important to point out that um, the creation of an AI to review a non-disclosure agreement is, is kind of like a different process from like representing taxes data because this is like representing legal knowledge as a kind of model that 
um, a data set of like a non-disclosure agreement goes into and then subsequently is processed. Um, so what we're going to kind of go over here now is, uh, you know, where have we been? Uh, Actually, could I just say sure. one quick thing about where we were, have been like 10 seconds ago. Um, so on the NDA thing, where you could imagine that fitting, say, in a life cycle of a legal process might be um, for a business person, like the, the first place people go is uh, robot lawyers. Like could, could, how much life could we get successfully through without lawyers at all? How much legal knowledge and, and um, well, um, let's call it like um, skill and practice could be reduced to, to um, code. Um, so, you know, for small businesses and so forth, doing an NDA, that could be a real challenge. Or even for, for big businesses, uh, it could be a big spend. Um, it, it, then moving further down the spectrum toward um, human centrality, um, I could imagine when I was an in-house attorney, uh, if I had a tool like this um, to get me to the first draft or to the first um, first um, human analysis of an NDA I'm being presented with to do issue spotting, yeah. um, that is another way you could look at this. So it's not replacing the human, but maybe it's supercharging uh, the human. And then there's a matter of judgment about how, what, what the client's interests are, what their priorities are, and whether you know, they care so much about um, you know, how maybe for some clients, um, only having uh, uh, a um, restriction on, on, uh, on disclosure for two years is much more important than the range of certain types of information that are subject to the restriction on disclosure. So anyway, some, some uh, judgment about legal practice and representing the interests of a client um, could be advantaged by this. Or, or you, we could easily imagine kind of um, you know, uh, jobless, uh, you know, hellscapes of the future where the AI could actually do a worse job and we have over-dependence by using the same tools that we were just seeing. So um, part of what I think is interesting about where we've been is we're now in an exploratory, almost field building stage, I'd say, in the economy with computational law apps and um, services. Um, and we want to show you what some of those are, but we're not yet presupposing precisely how they should fit within the life cycle of legal practice or, um, or, or within um, you know, business and, 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 uh, and social processes. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Or I think that's a great thing to point out, um, especially because they're, they're, especially when you get to like litigation, there's a certain amount of uh, gamesmanship that takes place that you know, I, I, I think an AI would be very ill-equipped to, to handle something like that. Um, oh, do you mind? Speaking of practicing lawyers who have actually have MIT degrees. So, so let's consider a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, what you invest in the technology is definitely going to be influenced by um, what the improvement is and what the costs and risks are. So you said, um, we're looking at this chart yeah. and we see a 94 and we say it's a 9% difference. That's actually the inverse of the way I looked at it as a lawyer, which is that in the, in the AI case, there's only 6% error rate, and in the human rate, it's 15. It's three times worse because there are three times more, there's three times higher likelihood that something's gonna come back to bite you. So that's one. Number two, um, the context of litigation and things like that, yeah. there are already lots of tools that people use to manage things, like decision trees for working out you know, what's the potential progress of the litigation and which way it goes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the computational law applications can't even be identified without thinking about what the milieu is, the, the environment it's in. So I think we can, maybe we can start here by talking about what kinds of technologies can be applied, but I think there'll be a more fun discussion if at some point, which we're not, we're not gonna do in the next three days, to continue with this, we say, you know, look at the kinds of apps that people have used in the legal industry, and how could you take that technology? How, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, deep learning might could you be able to apply to what the average decision tree looking under litigation would be? To, in fact, seems to me to be very possible to do much better on strategy. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I don't yeah. accept the proposition that we're not going to get there. In fact, I think it's the opposite thing. I think. Um, by going in this direction, we'll be able to outsmart lawyers 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't mean to suggest that we weren't going to ever get there or that it would be impossible to get there. Yeah. I think my uh, my assertion was that there there's so much kind of uh, unique, uh, kind of almost quirky uh, behavior that goes on um, that, that lawyers over a period of time learn, right? That, uh, you know, some of this you can't, represent with a, a simple AI straight away. And, and so I think having this is a, you know, more like, a, a, as we'll get kind of later on, like a an Iron Man suit instead of like a C-3PO sort of thing where it's not fully automated, but it's, you know, this combination of human plus uh, machine gives you better results than human alone or machine alone. Now that's and, certainly, that, that, that makes total sense. I, I also see that you know, not falling into pitfalls sure. is, uh, is one of these things. And I think in the history of AI, there were a lot of things where people talked about sort of this mythology that humans could do something better. Hmm. It turned out to be false. Hmm. So I think it may turn out that the, the assistant thing is good too, mm -hmm. but there may be, it, it may be better than C-3PO or yeah. yeah. It may be that all of a sudden, like for very routine stuff, it would be right. Like yeah. for, uh, Oh, I think you jumped me on. I'm sorry, I'm Richard. Richard. Hi, Richard. Hi. To MIT alums. So um, and then uh, just as a placeholder, slide 17, which we should not skip, okay. uh, will get us to the um, this tantalizing idea you had. Can we extrapolate across a bunch of areas of law and uh, see where people are using apps and services right now and what we can learn from that? So we've got a bit of a breakdown in the market uh, that we should use to do some brainstorming. So let's, I guess that's a note for us. Let's yes. not skip slide 17. Okay. So we're, we're together. Uh, great. So, um, Brian, I, I think you don't want to scare anybody, but okay. I think, I think, but uh, I think, well, I uh, yeah, I'm with you, Richard. Um, so what's really fascinating here, I think, is that, uh, and what I think what you're getting at, Richard, is that when you, when you look at any kind of system, when you go down to a very, very uh, low level, Yes. It's the very, very tiny changes that make the biggest differences in architecture and what happens, you know, in terms of usability and interaction at the top. And I think what you're getting at, Richard, is that, you know, when, when we take the data and we code, encode it in a way in which we can uh, apply AI to it, then even very, very tiny changes in that encoding process makes for really large changes at higher level systems oh, sure. that are AI based. Yeah. Right? And, and when, when one starts to think about smart contracts and the data as encoded yeah, yeah, yeah. as contracts, et cetera, et cetera, you begin to realize that the design of these things becomes extremely important oh, in terms of in terms and, of what comes out the other end. And, and enough to maybe leapfrog, you know, into new ways of of you know doing analysis, like you said, the decision trees. And you and you end up in someplace entirely different, I think. One explanation. Yeah, I, I think that's just like nice and close to your mouth. Yeah, I think it's true. Um, so if you can very quickly size up your options in a way that's more concise and the and and in terms of design i mean there are two there are a couple of independent aspects of what we're talking about for design in terms of applications one would be sort of the data architecture and another one are the designs that allow us to integrate to them with human factors and the human factors like the user interfaces yeah. the quality of the documents how that come out of them are the documents close enough to being drafts for a particular purpose, a particular yeah. court, a particular phase in litigation, a negotiation. Sure. And the ability to do those things with a high level of accuracy, and then as as uh, as Daza was suggesting, like, or, or you were also suggesting, like, as this thing becomes an assistant to you, all of a sudden your time is being spent, not, in fact, um, doing something else, but rapidly internalizing. Yeah. What the what the salient issues are right. in in the law, and we sometimes call that um, with technology practicing at the top of your license, and not you know 
yeah, incessantly, we, like yeah. playing with margins on I Microsoft would, I Word. I know about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I, was, I was thinking more like assembly. I mean, like yeah. Just, Document well, assembly? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the bottom, like assembly. Like, oh, oh, right, uh, assembly so, language. So, the, so oh, there, yeah. there is one point I'd like to make, but like uh, in, so in the job I had before this, we were, I was at a company called Risk Genius, and we were breaking down insurance policies and we had developed a taxonomy where we could categorize the clauses of the policy, you know, by line of business, by whether it was, you know, a certain type of clause, so definition, exclusion, insuring agreement, condition, so on and so on. And then within each of those, you could go on down, you know, a few levels. And one of the things that we were able to do that was like very meaningful for the insurance industry was we were able to figure out, you know, so say a new regulation comes out and that impacts one clause in every policy, but you don't know how many policies it in, it's in because so many of these uh, insurance carriers have only gone digital very recently. Like, how are you able to go through that, uh, the, the 200,000 policies that could have that language in it and quickly identify exactly where that clause is, uh, you know, get an endorsement so that that clause is changed and then reissue the policy to that individual. And what we were able to do is based on this taxonomy that we developed, we were able to go in, have the policy uploaded, you know, run it through this machine learning algorithm and identify it much quicker than, you know, a human ever could. And so I, I, I definitely agree it comes down to the, to the uh, you know, almost like developing a taxonomy for how that data is represented, uh, developing the kind of like populating the, uh, the leaves on the tree, the, the, uh, the computational layers around it so that it is much more amenable to those sorts of processes. But then it all comes back to, you know, you have to have somebody look at that and make the determination of, oh, what do we need to issue in order to replace this? What do we need to issue in order to, you know, make sure that we're adequately covered? It, it, there is still going to be that, that role. It's just going to be a different role. And, and a, a kind of glib analogy with somebody uh, mentioned to me one time was that if a calculator hasn't replaced an accountant, you know, one of these AIs isn't going to replace a lawyer. And so I think it's, it comes down to like a, a, a tool selection issue. And, uh, you know, each tool has its uh, strengths and weaknesses. And mm -hmm. so it, I, I hesitate to like look at AI as, you know, the, the kind of the other analogy of like to, to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I don't think we need to kind of. Yeah, well, uh, we, we certainly have enough of that with AI, but I do think in the example you gave is a really good one because the chances are that it's vastly more efficient, but not only that, yeah. more accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, All right, right. So, so sit down. Now. Yeah, please. Yeah, because <laughs> um, we have people online that aren't able to, um, you know, you know, like um, siege the bench here. <laughs> so, um, uh, Michael, um, I believe you you had something. Yeah, look, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with anything that's been said here. I just probably more from the perspective of a from a, of a practicing lawyer, and I spent a lot of my time doing contract analysis and drafting. Um, I, I certainly think the tools that are available at the moment, there are a lot of useful ones out there. I haven't used uh, Law Geeks out there, but, um, but certainly I think there are a lot of tools which can be useful for flagging issues at the moment. But for me, I think the largest part of my role in any sort of contract analysis or drafting perspective, drafting role is more about a, it's more of a linguistics and semantics aspect of looking at looking at language and whether they're drafted in a way which is clear and concise. Um, things like consistent terminology and um, ensuring that, say, defined terms are used in the correct in the correct order. And if there's anyone in the in the, in the room who's, uh, I know there's a few people who've got some linguistic and um, AI. Uh, backgrounds um, as far as I'm aware like that sort of a task that little sort of high level cognitive reasoning process where it's a uh, action linguistic semantics of a bespoke document which something which is very different than what a system has otherwise already been trained on is not really possible to do with any sort of AI system at the moment and that would be the big breakthrough of a time consuming and reducing volumes of work is frankly that cognitive understanding of, of the, and of readability, um, as opposed to purely rule-based systems and flagging, say, contracts got an indemnity, so that's a bad thing, um, flag that. Um, that is where the bulk of the time is actually spent. 
right? Yeah, and I, and I think that also gets to the the notion of having like standards and like standard clauses and you know, uh, Sally S A L I. They have the legal mat legal matter specification standard um, that uh, purports to uh, you know represent common legal matters as uh, as though it were like something in supply chain, like a, co a transaction code in a supply chain. And so I think uh, I think that's the direction things are heading. Um, and and we I, I believe we touched on that later. Perhaps in this, presentation. we should we should circulate that maybe after class. Yeah. But Sally just came up with a new standard, which is pretty complete for identifying parties and the type of legal matter and a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, it's, I think it's like a, a, a um, honeypot for analytics and automation. A couple of things that come to mind um, for what um, it's Richard. Yeah, uh, something that Richard said about. Um, you know, be doing initial uh, analysis better. Um, uh, have people heard of Kira systems? Kira, um, so about half in the room have. Uh, we can send a link, but there's a several vendors on slide 17, we'll do a breakdown, that do a pretty good job of initial um, issue spotting, yeah. uh, in contracts in particular, and some in other kind of expert areas. There's also this really interesting tool that I saw at, um, um, future law conference at Stanford. It's this um, annual codex conference that they do um, called Lawtomation. Um, and if, I want to see if we can get those folks yeah. in to do a demo. Have you seen that yet? Yeah. It's pretty remarkable. Um, it's really cool stuff. And so like you, you can, uh, it can, among other things, um, get you to the first draft of like pleadings and um, um, and like a complaint or, or a response to a complaint in litigation. Again, back to something that Richard had said. Law automation, also kind of a cool name. It looks cooler than it, it's than it sounds, I think. Uh, but um, but it uh, but what's really interesting is that they go really deep jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So they have a handful of jurisdictions right now, um, and 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 uh, when you look at it, like it knows kind of what to look for in terms of like the and what the points are you're going to want to prove what types of causes of action you might want to be looking at based on the facts and then it and it does a really good machine job for doing a response to a complaint so that you make sure that you you know you've alleged everything you have to or state everything you have to, to to make your best case for summary judgment or to find any affirmative defenses and to kind of say everything in the right way and so it's just kind of like it's really remarkable uh, what it can do, uh, or what at least uh, based on their demo, um, at least. Uh, so, uh, it, where are we now? We are uh, one place we are now is at three thirty-seven p.m. Eastern time, oh, yeah. which is uh, precisely seven minutes after we promised that we would end. We've always done this class up to five p.m. Um, and then frequently actually ended at like six or one time near seven p.m. I think with people really cranky and babysitters, you know, sending emergency beacons and things like that. And so we thought, okay, let's pretend to end it at 3.30 this time and then see if we could beg people uh, to see how many people would be willing to go a little extra, like extra innings, like baseball, because it's fun. Uh, so we wonder, um, are people um, online, um, would people be willing to go, you think we can whiz through these before four? Yeah, we can we can do really quickly. Do yeah. like the skip across the top of the waves. Is is anyone online able to go another twenty minutes? Or if you're not, uh, let us know. And people here in the room, it, 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 by unanimous consent, could we okay. go till four p.m.? We're gonna have to speed. Is that possible? We have to go. Gotta right. hit the road. Did this explain anything about what you're interested in with what's computational law? Yeah, I said uh, one thing uh, that was. Interesting. If you have this computation log and you have this code, is it going to prove the argument of the machine or is it the human? Yeah. Um, do you want it to be written to machines or that was a, you know, like a question. Yeah, there's a, there's a really cool company called Lexon that uh, they, they have almost like a, it's not a compiler, but it, uh, it's almost like an editor where you can type in uh, contract obligations and it represents them as though they were like smart contract code for like solidity. And so you can see like what changing like one clause of like human text does to like the machine text. And so it's kind of a really fun way to, to get to uh, 
to get to that and I'll slide 27. Okay. Um, so just forward really before you go, so. since, since I now, this is the first time I found out what you were interested in. So just before you go, here's a beautiful slide just for you. Um, so one, I'm going to call it a, a design pattern that we favor, uh, is, um, for short, we call it like BLT, like a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Uh, but it stands for the business, uh, legal and technical, let's say, dimensions of like information. Uh, and so w we think uh, when there's a contract or a legal process, even a statute, um, that um, we want to see it expressed um, in machine readable code for sure. Don't miss that or it won't be computational. In human readable code, and by that, let's just say plain language, like maybe 12th grade like um, filter, it would, it would qualify as like um, um, 12th grade, I think is, the, is about the right level for human readable plain language. And then legal code, which is not 12th grade um, plain language, it's actually of necessity um, fairly dense um, and um, uh, it's dense and um, um, it has a lot of jargon in it and the jargon has meaning. Um, and so, um, creative, you know, Creative Commons license. Um, so the Creative Commons license is not a bad example of that. Um, it has the legal code where it goes through all the edge cases and intellectual property for that type of copyright license. Um, it's much longer. It has the so-called human readable plain language code, which is like less than a page, and, and which can even be reduced down to a, an icon. Um, and then it has the machine readable layer, which people don't, don't use much, but it, they've got an interesting, um, uh, what is that triplets language? RDF. RDF. Uh, they have an RDF version, which is machine readable. So leaving aside, you know, their specific machine readable, like I would choose something like JSON or something that may be more commonly used. Maybe XML is, is a good good match for machine readability or whatever the right machine readability is for the legal thing that you're doing. But by um, identifying each one of those layers of the, the rule or the legal instrument or whatever it is, and then um, um, harmonizing them so that they're, they have equivalence, um, aligning them and harmonizing them, and then ultimately integrating them so that they're three aspects of the same thing, you know, which you can do with like section headers or you can do some of it in metadata, but it's one thing uh, we think is, is a good way to ensure that, um, uh, that, the, that the computational legal system serves, the correct, serves a, a full purpose for the machines and for the humans, both kinds of humans. The regular humans that you know uh, that need to operate with the law, as well as the legal system. Um, it's so like an effective translation. Yeah. So on different projects I've been on, mostly in consulting over the years, uh, but also at MIT. Um, it depending on what what it, it's about, it may be emphasizing one or more of those layers. Depend, and that's very context specific, but we actually think there ought to be better reusable common like design patterns and templates and frameworks so that you always um, explicitly I, um, solve for each of those three layers in a, in a unified integrated way. Does that sort of? That's hard. Um, so you, you like increasingly have to be trilingual or, or, but you remember, remember Joey Ito? Um, and so he used to, uh, you know, he had that phrase, we want to be anti-disciplinary or, you know, maybe cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. I think it, like one of the ways that I, that I try to make sure that they're equivalent when I write rules for um, systems. So I've done a lot of supply chains, and payment networks, and uh, other types of federations is I will, if, if, it's, if it's a big system, I will actually have a single document. And I'd put this in the scope of work in the beginning when, when I'm working with somebody to help them architect and, and write it up. Uh, the first section is called, is the business stuff. So, um, so it's like, you know, like who's in and who's out, who's, who's paying, um, you know, business practices, a few things like that. The second section is the legal stuff. So that's like 80% liability usually, but IP and, you know, other lots of little legal things, notice, whatever, uh, indemnification. And then the third section is the, the fun stuff, like the technology stuff, what standards are we using? How do we connect things? How do we, you know, up rev? What are the testing? What are the security requirements and so forth? And then I have a single table of, con a, a single table of contents, but a single glossary. 
That's the most important thing. And so to the extent, so that, and then um, I'll, I'll try to break it up so that um, there, the, it's like the, the technical people have primacy over what's in the technology parts. They're answerable to a CIO or a CTO or whatever. The legal people are answerable to like a general counsel or risk management officer, compliance. The business people usually go up to the CEO or COO or CFO, but that there's someone that's really in charge of each one of those. And before they uprev their section of the document, they actually show it to the other groups and we kind of circulate it back and forth so that if something's changing in one place, we understand the implications in other places. And to the extent possible, any people from any one of those sections areas should be able to read the whole thing and have a real good idea of what's going on, um, even if some of it's quite dense. Uh, and then sometimes we end up using the same word to mean different things, and that's okay. We define that when we do. Uh, you know, but, but the idea is that, it all, that there's a single unified glossary or, um, and, and that there's one table of contents so you don't, so that the, others, the other parts of the system aren't invisible or opaque or confusing to people. But even then, it's like there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, it takes a while for people to get the hang of things that they don't yet know or understand. Uh, and so people that are in the business or the technology kind of aspects of a project aren't going to become like legal scholars and lawyers aren't going to become computer scientists and so forth. Uh, but they need to be conversant enough to see the interdependencies and to be able to uh, come, uh, uh, and, and part of the way I try to facilitate that is by putting in a single document and circulating it a lot until we get alignment, harmonization, and integration. Just, uh, something Won't you please? Um, um, here you go. So, so, so this is a bit technical, but um, this has to do with also the, the translation notion that um, one of the participants was talking about. And so you can, have, um, you can have translations at the sort of term level where uh, between technical languages and natural languages where you think things are aligned, but it's in addition uh, to the terms at the, on the technical language side, it's the rules of inference that also matter that can lead to strange consequences. So there are, there are well-known things like, um, so there are the deontic logics, logics of like obligation, what you must do and what you can't do and so on. And there are well-known things like the, uh, the miners paradox where translating these, you know, these uh, innocuous looking sentences in English into certain deontic logic frameworks, so the technical expression of those things, it looks like they're lined up. So at the term level, you can say, okay, yeah, this, this sentence says what that sentence says, but because you've embedded it in this language that has these rules of inference, you infer these weird consequences uh, that are not um, possible in, that you don't infer in English. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the alignment at the sort of term and meaning level that matters, it's also uh, this, um, these inferences. Yeah, and the that's background such, a logic. Great, such a great point. Not so fast, Mister. Oh. Stay right there. Um, but uh, just a, a uh, some a one. So I I kind of blended a lot of stuff together really fast. But alignment I I do is the, in the in the beginning because just so we can begin. Uh, and then when when I say harmonization, I actually mean kind of almost. I don't want to be too fancy with words, but getting it to a more of a semantic level. Uh, and then one of the ways that we test that I've tested that is, um, and I'll share this in our Telegram channel. Uh, I've got a great rule set in from the insurance industry for ID Federation, uh, where um, they permitted me to publish it under Creative Commons, uh, so we can look at it as an example. But basically, we have a set of use cases that are the approved, authorized use cases that describe what we think will happen when this set of circumstances comes together. So basically, we have this. It is not like a formal verification by any means, but we have a way of testing what the probable legal and technical functional results will be against like situations. So, or um, I think Richard used the word frames uh, from, uh, but anyway, we use like use cases and legal fact patterns, like a blend of them. And then we run the ones that people care again about against each one of those layers to see what would we think the results will be. And then we try to harmonize that, is that word I use? But then at the end of the day, though, a lot of this stuff is so squishy because we're not dealing with 
an entirely constrained context. Um, like things are dynamic and we may not have thought of all the use cases that will become relevant in a year or two from now um, at all. Uh, and so there's a, I think there's a lot of unknowability at the edges, which I, you know, it's largely unknowable at the edges, but what we wanna do is reduce the darkness. We wanna increase the likelihood of, um, of correctly assessing what the legal results will be, you know, what the business results will be and what the technical results will be in these systems. So here's sort of like a way to begin to get there. I, one fine day, and this is where I wanted to ask you not to leave yet, uh, I, I wonder if we couldn't, if we actually had an area of law that let's say through like federal legislation was like complete, so anything else was preempted, so this is like the complete area of law to, to start with that assessment. Uh, and then if it was fully computational, like let's just say like all the statutes, the regulations, even the case law was computational, if we couldn't actually then create like a legal instrument or, or structure a transaction in a way where we could formally verify every permutation of things that could possibly happen and um, and know in advance what the legal results would be. Yeah. Is, you think, yeah. is that doable? That's, that's what you're talking about. So earlier, we were talking about simulation. This is where simulation and use cases become very, very interesting. Brendan just uh, noted that this is where simulation against use cases becomes very interesting. Just so, um, yeah, so we, one day, we, so tomorrow as a quick look ahead, we're gonna have Sandy Pentland ooh, um, come and talk about his, um, I'd say like groundbreaking article of perspective on legal algorithms. And part of that's going to be talking about literally how do we architect and engineer systems so that we could um, meaningfully um, measure everything um and start to instrument the system yeah. and um and then be able to Test, adapt in real adapt, time audit yep that all of that great that. stuff hmm. but but when you said yeah do, do you think it's a realistic goal to have like as part of computational law in our program here formal verification or do you think that's just too far out and we shouldn't even bother talking about it and could you grab the mic oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't have any, you know, I don't have a concrete area of law in mind, um, but I mean, it does seem like, you know, tax is one of the most more likely uh, candidates that some of the more, you know, um, objective kind of parts of the tax code seem like they could be completely formalized like that. And so, and then do you think there would be a way to express it so that through software and people's understanding that we could surface and harmonize the like second level inferences you're talking about in, in machine logic so that it matches what we're saying in natural language? Or is that even a realistic or desirable goal? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a desirable goal. And I mean, you know, so in logic there's, you know, this, these notions of soundness and completeness. Yep. So completeness means that everything that you think should be inferred can be inferred and soundness that everything that can be inferred is a valid inference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can prove both of those in formal systems. So, um, yeah. So it gets down to make, being really explicit about our priors, right? And uh, making sure that they're and, correct. And the axioms and the rules of inference. The axioms. Thank you. Um, did somebody? Uh, okay, so I think we're we're now we're now back to zero. We have no backlog. Um, I think I answered your the question that you had before you snuck away. You're free to go if if you want to. Uh, but uh, we actually have a delightful seven more minutes to whiz through, yeah, like the best of. Well, we we have to we have to go back as well. Yeah, Thank you. Cheers. Um, so the initial adoption. Um, as we can kind of see represented in the next slides, uh, looks at kind of like duplicating processes as like a paper-based paradigm. Um, and so, you know, digital formats obviously enable a lot more than that, but the, uh, you know, the, really the direction that we're headed is, you know, to have things that are model-based, uh, algorithmic, um, these kind of like modular little um, containers of services that can be uh, you know, configured and uh, compiled together in interesting ways. So it looks like going from paper to, you know, the notion of. Uh, oh, and this gets to reengineering. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so going. So there may not be an equivalence. This is very much in tune with what um, Cool Brian just said about, you know, the things that may appear to be the same, uh, but there may be 
real differences with the outcomes. So when in the beginning of uh, aeronautics, when we were trying to you know make things that would allow people to fly, people there's a lot of evidence of designs that look like birds of people. Some people assume we need like wings that would flap because see, that's how birds do it. And um, I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen like clips from like the tens and the twenties with people, you know, crashing at the bottom of cliffs, trying to get these flapping wings. And then, and then the in great insights were made about fixed wing and you know, we made a lot more progress. So we found a way to engineer in a sense, re-engineer, based on the materials and the, and the resources that we had at hand, ways to achieve the result we were seeking. But it wasn't a one-to-one -one, like extrapolation from, you know, from some um, natural system. And so you know, some business process and other re-engineering is going to be needed for sure just to get the intended results for computational law and lit. Oh, so where wait. are we now? And oh, yeah. this is kind of, I think the slide that Dazza was referencing earlier, but uh, Codex has this uh, legal tech index that uh, characterizes uh, the state of the marketplace for a lot of uh, legal innovations. And they, they've broken it out into these nine categories. And I think they may have a few more, but uh, you, know, you can see marketplace, document automation, practice management. Legal research, legal education, ODR, e-discovery, analytics, and compliance. Yeah. And there's some blur. So there's a number of products and services and projects that will, will cut across a lot of these categories. But these do seem to be, if we just start from an analysis of the marketplace of uh, apps and services and projects, these are pretty solid categories. And they built it from the ground up by yeah. literally going through and doing hundreds or thousands now, mm -hmm. I think, of entries of companies and products and pro projects. Um, and so the, the kind of next direction that we're headed is, you know, expressing law as uh, standard data in these interoperable service interfaces um, so that, you know, these great things can happen, like updates are provided, alerts are provided, you know, there are internal, external linking of, you know, these different applications. Um, you can start to imagine, uh, you know, chains of these uh, apps and services that are connected to form, you know, a network of computational systems so that it's easier for people to um, interface with the, the legal system and with a better user experience. Um, and so what does this look like? You know, this is kind of a, a good representation as, as a sample JSON schema. Um, and this, XML. This also looks like, uh, uh, you know, having an API with, you know, different documents, you could have like a REST API and you could be able to like get and post all of these. Uh, so this is like some documentation on like a generic API. So you can imagine like, what would that look like for the IRS? Like, you know, get the formula for depreciation on something and plug it in. Um, and, and then up in the right is the XBRL. Um, so the extensible Business. We love that rule. Uh, yep. Yeah. Extensible XBRL, extensible business rules language. Okay. Language. Um, and it's a dialect of XML that's really designed for financial accounting. And when you're analyzing SEC filings that have been filed um, and tagged basically with XBRL, it's, it's awesome, including for investigative reporting, but also just to get insight if you're an investor or if you're a regulator or an law enforcement of any type. Um, it's just great, it, and especially for the tangle of footnotes. Part of the reason why SEC adopted XBRL was in reaction to the Enron debacle, where you know I think technically some of the worst excesses of like the shell games were technically disclosed if you could piece together you know the Byzantine chain of like uh, footnotes that referenced other footnotes, but. It, it, but humans really could barely comprehend that, and that was somewhat deliberate, as it turned yeah. out. Um, but okay. when they're all tagged, um, you can very rapidly see how how these things fit together, and and uh, and and you can go you know faster, further, yeah. and, and deeper. And especially when there are standards as well about you know what it, what can happen. Um, right. Number one portions. Number two. Um, Mo it's voluntary still, um, and so for the um, filings that are XBRLizable, um, uh, only a, a minority of publicly traded companies, um, a small minority, actually do mark it up that way. Although um, Hester, remember her last name? Pierce. Pierce. Hester Pierce, one of the SEC commissioners, 
he's afraid of having young brain, uh, uh, is, uh, came to MIT not long ago, and we also saw her in Chicago uh, like a month before, and I had a chance to ask her um, about XBRL and whether they were going to be pushing this to make it more widely used. And um, she um, was happy to hear that people cared. I don't think they've heard a lot from people that are seeking XBRL. Uh, so like this isn't high on their list for user demand, but but she noted it. Um, and I said it twice in two different cities. So I don't know. Uh, so everybody tell Hester and the other SEC commissioners how much you love XBRL and let's see if we can't get it more broadly used. Uh, cool, Brian understood that it's going to be mandatory at some point in the future. Well, you know, from your mouth to the regulator's ears. Fingers crossed, I guess. Um, and then Alexander pointed out that there's a link in the Zoom chat that we can throw into the Telegram channel that has a list of the market for Nordic legal tech as well. Oh, so cool, we can cool. kind of do a comparison and that might be interesting. Um, so getting kind of a little bit down down the stream, you know, they're, they're um, also, this is kind of just a pictographic representation of what we've been going through where it's, you know, these interoperable services with an API layer communicating to these different, different pieces. Um, you know, you start to have sensors, sensors trigger rules, rules trigger workflows and workflows trigger actions. I think that's kind of the essence of, you know, how do we get from like something that exists as a static process to something that achieves a real world outcome through the use of line computation. Yep. And a sensor here could be as simple as like a listener and a web server. So it's like, did somebody do a filing? Oh, here's a new filing. Or did a new client come in and just give me a new NDA to look at or whatever yeah. it is. So something happened uh, in time and space. You applied rules, you had some kind of workflow to go from this intake and then I put it into my process and I did a thing um, and then I took an action like I sent a letter of representation or I sent a, a markup of the NDA or I sent a, yep, that looks fine, sign it or whatever. So, the, and you could genericize this very gen generic um, kind of like a, a ex explanation of automation to all sorts of legal um, instruments and processes we think. And yeah. but looking at how to put things in boxes to make them modular, we think is a, is a very important way to make this something that can be architected and where we can start to um, get more power out of doing more defined capabilities and sequencing them correctly without having like one big fat code base do a lot of things and not being able to change the rules. Especially notice how the rules are in a box. Oh, how I want rules in a box. So that, you know, when the rules change, we just change the rules. And when other things change, we change those things and we can model stuff. Right now, a lot of legal software is, a lot of software that's legal tech and just a lot of software in general combines all this stuff in ways that are totally interdependent. It's like spaghetti. So we think more modularity is critical for, um, for like a, a, a usable uh, and scalable um, uh, adoption of computational law. Yeah, and I, and I think it, it's important to point out that sensors in a certain sense could be uh, actions that are triggered by, you know, the attorney themselves. Yep. So, uh, you know, send a client engagement letter, that could be a sensor to create a new file. And then the new file, once it's created, has a, has a set of rules that indicate that you should, you know, check off one of, you know, four or five boxes that are, uh, relate to the type of service that it is. Say you want to form a company and then that, you know, forming the company triggers the workflow for, okay, we need to get an EIN. We need to file articles of organization with the secretary of state. We need to create a operating agreement. We need to, um, you know, do have, we have these optional triggers for uh, amending the operating agreement or filing the annual filings. And then even a, a, a safety valve for dissolving the entity completely. And, and so once, you know, you have that workflow, you can start to call on those different pieces and it gets you to those actions that are at the end of the, end of the chain. And when I was uh, making this slide, I was, uh, I was got to get super fancy and make it a circle because some people's actions are other people's inputs, you know, uh, or like, you know, out, some outputs are other inputs. So, uh, so that's where we get into the idea of chaining these things. Okay, let's move forward, not okay. go deeper. Um, yeah, so sprint, uh, sprint. yeah, so uh, the the desirable destination for this is, um, you know, you have Git, you have version control systems where you're actually able to go through, you're able to edit, you're able to see all the changes that take place. 
and you're able to develop a greater context for why we have the things that we have now. Yeah, so just for the publishers in the house uh, and, and others, uh, like right, right now one of the, okay, let me start by saying uh, the Microsoft Office Suite obviously is a triumph of our species. Uh, Microsoft Word is amazing in terms of what it's made available. So, you know, hats, hat tip. And it's also become somewhat of a prison. Um, so having um, legal documents and, um, and, and everything locked in PDF and Microsoft Word is not, it's digital, but it's hardly computational. What we really need to be able to do is break it out, treat it as data, and also have version control on it. Um, and, and so something like the GET protocol really gets us there. So when we do the, um, when, when I do legal contracts now, if they involve a lot of parties and I'm involved in it, I will put it in, in GitHub. Uh, for example, or uh, increasingly Bitbucket. Uh, and that way we can actually see exactly what version we're working on. We can branch it. So if people are looking at like, well, what if we did this a little differently? We can put that in a different branch and play it out. And if people really like it and they want to agree to that, we can merge the branches later. But, um, but the first like 20 minutes of most meetings I've, I've ever been on with a bunch of parties negotiating a, a contractor when I was doing government stuff like a regular version of regulations. Wait, what version are we on? Oh, I emailed it last Tuesday. Oh, is it final, final 3B? Um, no, it's the other one. Oh, which one? Oh, it's no final, final 3A, but I actually changed it, but I didn't change the wording and look at the date. And then by the time we have an idea of what document we're even talking about, that's a real bad time. Uh, but then also you have to look at the comments and there are all these comments on the side. It's okay if you have two or three comments, but it's not actually data. It's hard to export those differently. It's hard to check them off. Um, what we really need to do is treat these things as, as like the same way people treat software uh, and put it in a code repository. So we know the versions, we can see issues, we can do branches and forks. We can actually manage the information appropriately and make sure it's all hashed. So there's no, absolutely no question about you know, what version it was. This is like old, obvious, simple things if you're doing you know, like a $10 you know, JavaScript app, but this is brand new territory for the law. And this would clear out a lot of the underbrush that is holding us back now. So that, that slide on get is like, you know, just, it's boring. It, we shouldn't have to talk about it so much in a class like this, but it's a, almost a matter of theology that, it, that we must spread the good word about the get protocol. And it's and it's criticality for computational law. Okay, so in the <laughs> so picking up from there, the 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 goal that we see is uh, to make it so that legal content is created, collected in standard formats and data structures that can be displayed as legal processes, rules, and that can be understood by anybody in plain language, usable by lawyers, and processable by machines. So getting back to that uh, uh, slide that we had talked about earlier, where it's like got the three layers, the BLT layers. And then, you know, from there, there are a lot of interesting things that can happen. So we have, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, good, good point. Uh, it's now 407. Um, we, we've, we're, 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 we're coming we're, in for a landing. Speeding. Um, and so, uh, you know, the notion of uh, how law is practiced is going to change with the um, kind of advent of uh, Alexa and these human computer interfaces. Um, it's also, you know, the, the way that we imagine it is a little bit different. And this is something that I had referenced earlier where, you know, you think about autonomous systems, you know, that's not really the goal that we've got in mind. We've got really this extended or augmented intelligence kind of idea where everybody is able to kind of leverage the technology in order to practice at the top of their license. We call it um, extended cognition at the media lab. So that's so, the idea, it's, a, it's extending the capabilities of people, not replacing people. Uh, and, and so some of the success measures of what computational law or what ideally computational law could do include achieving predictable legal outcomes, um, simplifying, identifying, um, kind of these rules and processes so that they're easier for humans to understand, uh, simulating, you know, what happens, uh, can we, you know, fully comprehend some of the formal logic um, of all of this, and then um, measuring the effectiveness and verifying that the, the results are what we think they are. And so the, uh, the, the kind of architectural stack that en enables this would be something like the OSI seven layer um, stack, 
of, uh, you know, you have an application, you have a presentation, you have a session, um, you know. So on. And so on. And then uh, the one on the, this is the last slide. The one on the right is, um, is an ex sort of a extrapolation of the OSI seven layer stack uh, to business. And this was uh, a group that I used to participate with a lot in the, in the 90s called CommerceNet. Uh, and uh, this one represents um, a pretty clean, high level architecture, what we thought e-commerce was going to look like, but it's that's sort of adjacent to law. And so it's kind of this idea there's like networks, like the internet or something, and that contains markets, you could say, and markets contain businesses, yeah. like a businesses would have identifiers and things. businesses conduct like service, have services and services, uh, uh, can uh, conduct interactions or transactions or, and other interactions and those have documents I would call those that a record now probably as opposed mm -hmm. to document that's a little less paper concept and then instead of information items I would just say data in 2020 uh, as opposed to 1996 or whenever we did this uh, ancient times um, but but it's not so different so here's another way to look at modularity or I'd say layering a stack and to understand kind of when we're creating computational legal systems, which ones fit in what stack and keep kind of keeping those swim lanes um, able to move independently, we think is, is a good clean architecture. Yeah, and, and I think... Um, oh, I thought that was yeah, the last slide. Yeah, the, we've got, there are a lot of slides in this deck. Okay, let's make the next one the last slide. Okay, well, I think we should have made the last, because these are, so these are the slides that are from uh, the presentation that I did last year. So, oh, so that's um, already on, um, uh, on Doc uh, Assemble. Yeah, on computational on Doc Assemble. Yeah, so, so let's save that for Thursday, I think, with the okay. community lawyer people. So we're going to stop here then. So, da da, there you have it computational law at a sprint. Yeah, um, that was, so. yeah, that was uh, approximately half the slides. <laughs> yeah, and these slides are actually like a very high level summary, believe it or not. Yeah. So, um, so with that, um, I want to say thank you very much for allowing us to go over time. Tomorrow, um, there is readings, which we'll, we'll send in the Telegram channel. Uh, everybody should read, and it's a short, yeah, wonderful read, Sand, pages Sandy in, uh, Pentland's um, uh, groundbreaking article, uh, A Perspective on Legal Algorithms. Um, and it's in the uh, law.mit.edu. It's the first article. I'll, um, I'll throw it up there right I'll throw now. It up there. Uh, and then we'll actually have Sandy with us. Um, uh, and he'll go over um, the, the essence of, of that um, vision of, for computational law. And then what I think we're going to do for tomorrow is, is make the tables into a circle um, and uh, make sure that everybody online can see everybody here. Uh, and then we're going to spend most of the time in a dialogue with Sandy. Um, for a lot, I think we'll have him for a full hour, so we will start on time tomorrow. And then, um, and then the second hour with Navroop is oh, a second hour is going to be uh, talking about economics and computational law with uh, with the digital economist Navroop. Yep, um, a lot of fun. Yep, and thanks that, for flexibility. Yep. Uh, I don't know to answer Michael's question. I think we'll probably have a different Zoom yeah. link. Um, and we'll be sending that out uh, five or ten minutes before the session starts so that everybody can access it, whether you're here or uh, remote. So um, if, uh, you know, if being remote is the easiest option, definitely do that. And even, uh, even for the people who are watching this on delay, uh, we know there are a few people who are, um, who are in time zones where it was even more inconvenient um, than 6 a.m. or 5.30 a.m. like it was with Michael. Um, so uh, they'll be watching this after the fact. And so, you know, feel free to pose questions in Telegram as you have them. And we can uh, kind of continue this conversation a little bit asynchronously. Yeah, and we, and we decided to do a bonus this year, too. Um, so because some of this is going to be new and may have ideas, we're going to encapsulate the sort of big questions that we identified together over the next uh, couple of days uh, and then post them in our Telegram channel and on the class website. And then you could just call it a day at that point. Or if you're interested and you've kind of met people or you yourself want to think about these things a bit, you have an opportunity to um, then write something up like a blog post or, or write up some code or something that is your take on it or write up better questions or even a critique. 
um, and then to kind of present that on a, right now tentatively it's January 24th when the last day of class we'll check with everybody what a good day would be uh, including Sandy yep. uh, and see if we can uh, then have people do like five or eight minute presentations of their thoughts on this uh, either their idea or their question or what have you and then we'll have a chance to have discussion around each one of those things so we'll have like a cap off section or something yeah. like that at the end of the IAP at the end of January. Uh, and hopefully that will even the playing field a bit for those of you in, uh, in all the different time zones of the earth. Okay. With that, I think, uh, I think that does it. For yeah, we the, need a gavel. Oh, we should have. This session is adjourned. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Great. Thanks Brendan.